Okay, live stream is up. PC recording good. Call recording rolling. Thank you. Backup is rolling. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing of the Committee on Housing and Buildings. At this time, would all panelists please turn on your videos. To minimize disruption, please place electronic devices to vibrate or silent. If you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at testimony at council.nyc.gov. Again, that's testimony at council.nyc.gov. Thank you for your cooperation. Chair, we are ready to begin. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm Council Member Robert E. Coney, Jr., Chair of the Council's Committee on Housing and Buildings. Uh, I'm joined today, uh, as I can see on my screen, by Council Members Brennan and Riley and Council Member Lewis. Um, Council Member Jonah, I'm sorry, has also joined us. Uh, during the 1970s and 1980s, oh, Council Member Cabrera, and I saw you earlier, Fernando, I apologize. <clears throat> during the 1970s and 1980s, New York City was a very different place than it is today. Landlords were abandoning both in inhabited and uninhabited properties, neglecting to pay municipal charges and leaving those properties in terrible physical shape. Third party transfer was a program created in the 1990s to resolve this issue. Through, th through third party transfer, the city foreclosed on properties with municipal liens and transferred those properties to third parties for rehabilitation and subsequent occupation. In one particular egregious instance, a resident of my district in particular, a retired nurse, Marlene Saunders, had her $2.2 million brownstone transferred to a third party over a less than $4,000 municipal charge. She only found out that her house had been transferred after it had been completed. My team and I worked with the late James Caldwell, Ms. Saunders and her family to have her house returned to her. But that <clears throat> Ms. Saunders and her family were incredibly upset as you can imagine, but this was not an isolated incident. Other homeowners, including HDFC shareholders and their well-maintained homes transferred over minor municipal charges. Many struggles to pay arrears only to have their properties transferred and the money they paid and the money they had paid lost. I'm sorry, I'm having a little bit of technical difficulties here. In July of 2019, the committee together with the Committee on Oversight and Investigations held a hearing to examine what went wrong during round 10. Since that hearing, the Council and the Department of Housing Preservation and Development, or HPD, had worked to draw lessons and put together a package of reforms to ensure Marlene Saunders' case and the severe inequities we saw in round 10 never recur. Thanks to the stakeholders and advocates who lent us their insights and expertise throughout the process, I know we will benefit from our continued engagement as we work toward passing concrete reforms. Today, we'll be hearing a pre-considered introduction, which I sponsored, that, whole, that overhauls third-party transfer and attempts to reform this troubled but essential program. Today, we'll also be hearing intro 2436, sponsored by Council Member Denise Miller, of which I am also a sponsor. This bill will create an Office of Homeowner Advocacy within HPD. OHA would be tasked with providing support to homeowners and owners of owner-occupied buildings. OHA would help these homeowners access needed financial and technical resources and help maintain the city's owner-occupied housing stock. We'll also be hearing proposed intro 1613, sponsored by Council, Council Member Fernando Cabrera, which relates to community and land trust as an eligible potential developer under TPT. Proposed intro 2378, which I sponsored related to HPD auditing some past violations and also re-examining the taxonomy of violations with stakeholders input and reporting their findings. Proposed intro 2246, sponsored by Council Member Brennan, would also establish a task force to study options and to make recommendations for converting vacant commercial spaces into affordable housing. Proposed intro 277, sponsored by Council Member Brandon, which relates to increasing the number of electric vehicle charging stations in parking lots and parking garages. Proposed intro 24, I'm sorry, 2312, sponsored by Council Member Riley, which limits the fees that can be charged to a tenant who is vacating a premise. Proposed intro 2411, which I sponsored, which relates to HPD's enforcement of the provisions of the zoning and resolution related to affordable housing. Pre-considered introduction sponsored by Council Member Gibson related to the penalties on immediately hazardous conditions at construction sites 
and penalties for one or four family homes. We are now here from the sponsors of intro 2246, council member, I'm sorry, um, uh, we will hear from uh, the sponsor of council member 2312, council member Riley. Uh, thank you, Chair Carnegie. Thank you to the committee uh, council and, and the committee of housing. Um, my name is council member Riley. Um, and today it, it, it gives me great importance that I bring forth intro 2312. Uh, this legislation amends the administrative code of the city of New York, limiting fees where a tenant must vacate a premises in violation of terms of a lease. Uh, with the recovery of COVID-19, um, as our communities are, are really fighting back, um, this pandemic is still underway. And we recognize that many New Yorkers, especially tenants, are still faced with some hardship. Uh, while the road to reconstructing our city is not going to be easy and will not happen overnight, uh, we need to implement local laws to ensure that tenants and not only tenants, landlords are protected and given the opportunity to support their families and move forward from this pandemic. This bill will limit additional fees such as cleaning and paying of a premises, which can be placed at an inconvenience to a tenant to benefit the landlord to reoccupy their spaces. Alongside with Councilmember Powers, Councilmember Traeger, and Councilmember Rosenthal, I present Local Intro 2312 to provide New York New Yorkers who are in need of assistance. Many unforeseen circumstances can resort, result in a tenant's need to change their housing situation, from unexpected changes to financial status, safety, and well-being issues, and more. We must ensure that New Yorkers can or Excuse me, we must ensure that New Yorkers are not further burdened or punished. I would like to thank you, uh, Chair Carnegie Jr. and my colleagues in government. I encourage the support of this bill and its significance to many New York families. I look forward to partnering to pass this legislation that aids in restoring our communities from this pandemic. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Riley. We will now hear from the sponsor of Intro 2246, Council Member Justin Brennan. Thank you, Chair. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I say all the time that one of the challenges of government is enacting big, bold policy while also sweating the small stuff. Intro 2246 is big, bold policy, and this is the right time to pass it uh, for New Yorkers. Homelessness, lack of affordable housing, and commercial vacancies were major concerns long before COVID-19 arrived in our city, and the pandemic has only exacerbated the problems surrounding all of these issues. Many employers, including big companies in tech and other kinds of office work, have found that a remote work model works well for them. In the same moment that their offices are sitting empty, we have an looming eviction moratorium expiration dates, a case backlog building up in housing court, and an ongoing public health crisis that makes homelessness more dangerous than ever. I can't imagine a better time for us to examine the potential of converting vacant office space into truly affordable housing as a way of putting a dent in all of these challenges at once. Um, and that is intro 2246. I'll say quickly on intro 277, I wanna thank uh, the chair and the committee for hearing this uh, introduction. This would expand the availability of electric vehicle charging stations and parking garages, $7.5 billion in federal grants for the expansion of EV charging stations is newly available thanks to uh, the recently passed federal infrastructure bill. Widespread use of electric vehicles in our city is only gonna be an invaluable part of adapting to the climate crisis if we make it easier for folks to charge their cars and, and more spaces for them to charge their cars. So we have to make that possible uh, by ensuring uh, people have more of these opportunities. And I think intro 277 would go a long way uh, towards making that happen. Thank you so much, Chair. Uh, thank you, uh, Councilmember Brown. And I do, I do want to say to you, though, though, as the host of the largest EV charging station in the Northeast in my district, um, I'm acutely aware of the importance of us moving forward, having that accessible to all citizens. Um, I, I have that luxury, right? I have, I have the largest at the uh, Pfizer plant. Um, and I know that based on its usage, that people are coming from all over and they should be able to access that from every point of the city. So uh, this is a great piece of legislation. Thank you for uh, bringing it to us. Um, I, I realize that we've been joined um, today by uh, Councilmember Rosenthal and also Councilmember Miller here who is speak ready to speak on uh, his bill, which is uh, intro 2436, I believe. Councilmember Miller. Thank you, uh, Chair Carnegie. 
and and uh, thank you to all my colleagues that are uh, that we're hearing the important legislation this morning around housing. Um, as as uh, Councilman Brennan just mis- mentioned that in these unprecedented times, it is so important that we get it right. It is important um, that that homeowners, renters alike make sure that we make sure that they understand rules of engagement and that they have the tools to navigate such. Um, that being said, it's is my pleasure to in, uh, introduce <clears throat> intro 2436, which creates the Office of Homeowner Advocates within the Department of uh, Housing Preservation and Development. I'd like to thank the chair for being the co-sponsor and, and obviously um, his best style experience as well as his upbringing in Southeast Queens really allows him to understand and appreciate the value and the need uh, for such a for such, a, for such an office. Also, appreciate uh, uh, the value of of home ownership and what it means to to uh, generational wealth and the opportunity for generational wealth. And so, um, but in doing so, we have to make sure that we protect and make that experience as, uh, as seamless as possible, that homeowner experience, experience as seamless as possible. The Office of Homeowner Advocate would provide direct support to homeowners, including acting as a liaison between them, the city, state, federal agencies. It would host training sessions and educate homeowners on how to access private and public financial and, and other technical resources. Training sessions would include homeowner 101, basic property management, utility payments, insurance, insurance, mortgage relief, and foreclosure prevention. Under provisions of this bill, the Office of Homeowner Advocate would be required to report annually on the number of homeowners inquiries received. Uh, the amount of time taken to address these inquiries and existing nonprofit organizations that pro- provide free and low cost services to homeowners, as well as recommendations for such services uh, uh, that are not currently available. For the over 70% of New Yorkers that are renters, home ownership is often a lifelong, lifelong dream, but attaining and maintaining that dream can be challenging and also can become a nightmare if not done right. Home ownership requires support that goes beyond the capacity of individuals, hardworking families, as hopeful or new homeowners must navigate confusing, confusing processes and, and secure and maintain their homes. Regular people need to have somewhere to turn when with one-stop shopping for resources, grants, financing, opportunities, and catalog of a nonprofits currently operating in this space. It is also important for homeowners to understand rules of engagement and their responsibilities when it comes to maintaining the home and the surrounding properties. The advocates would the advocates offices would help this, those hardworking families who often don't have time or resources to navigate the minutia of agencies within this process for themselves. So I want to thank the the chair for for co-sponsoring, but also your leadership on this. This is important. It is important for a plethora of reasons, as we talked, as we mentioned, uh, generational wealth, the impact on not just foreclosed homes, but poorly maintained homes and not unmaintained homes is really felt throughout communities. And so as we grow, we know the statistics on um, uh, net worth of families of color um, and the impact that home ownership has on that. Again, this is really important. I want to thank the chair for your leadership and look forward to uh, the passage of this legislation. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Miller. This bills like this are, are are kind of long overdue, so I want to thank you for um, uh, introducing it, allowing me to be a co-sponsor on it. Like you said, our two districts in particular have been disproportionately affected by lack of support for homeowners. This pandemic um, exacerbated that like it did many inequities. Um, So this is a very timely piece of legislation. I'm happy to be a part of it um, to serve not only our communities, but other underserved communities throughout the city who are seeking an opportunity to get a piece of the American dream through homeownership. So thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, are there any other council members who have bills today who'd love to, or who'd like to be able to uh, speak on their bills before we move forward? 
Uh, I believe that we've also been joined by uh, Council Member Brooks Powers. Good morning. Can we council? Are we going, are we ready to yes. give the first panel? I was waiting for you to turn it over to me. Sorry. Um, Sorry. It's okay. Um, good morning. Uh, I am Janan Zilka, Council to the City Council's Committee on Housing and Buildings. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are called to testify, at which point you will be unmuted. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask a question, please use the Zoom raise hand function and I will call on you in order. We will be limiting council member questions to three minutes, including responses. We will first be hearing testimony today from the administration, which will be followed by council member questions. This will be followed by testimony from members of the public. Today, Department of Housing Preservation and Development Deputy Commissioner Elizabeth Oakley will be testifying and Associate Commissioner Kim Darga will be available for Q&A. In addition, after, after HPD, Ben Furness, Director of the Mayor's Office of Climate mm -hmm. and Sustainability will be testifying and will also be available for q and I will now administer the oath. Um, I'm going to call on each of you to affirm yes or no after I've, I have said the oath. Um, please raise your right hand. Um, uh, do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Deputy Commissioner Oakley. I do. Associate Commissioner Darga. Yes. Director Furness. Yes. Thank you very, very much. Um, I just wanted to say we've been joined by Council Member Chen. Um, thank you. Uh, HPD, you may begin when ready. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Cornegy and members of the Committee on Housing and Buildings. My name is Liz Oakley, and I'm the Deputy Commissioner of Development with the New York City Department of Housing Preservation and Development, or HPD. I'm joined by our Associate Commissioner of Preservation, Kim Darga. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on a number of critical bills to strengthen HPD's tools to enforce our critical inclusionary housing programs, reform the city's third party transfer program, or TPT, and explore other avenues to create affordable housing opportunity and enhanced support for homeowners. As all of you know too well, New York City faces a long-standing housing crisis that requires us to explore every possible avenue for creating more affordable housing opportunities for New Yorkers across the five boroughs. The COVID-19 crisis has made the need for stable, affordable housing more important than ever. As the city works to rebuild from the pandemic, HPD is looking hard at the devastating health and economic impacts as well as the deeply embedded racial and economic inequities laid bare by COVID-19. We know that safe, quality, affordable housing is critical for the health and stability of our residents and the neighborhoods in which they live. And we are more focused than ever on what we can do to ensure an equitable recovery for all New Yorkers. Back in 2014, at the start of this administration, HPD had an impressive public-private production engine capable of building and preserving approximately 15,000 affordable homes per year. Over the next four years with new funding and tools, the city increased that capacity to 20,000 affordable homes per year. Finally, since 2018, HPD has met and exceeded our most ambitious goal of creating or preserving 25,000 affordable homes per year a rate the city has never achieved before, to fulfill the mayor's goal of financing the creation and preservation of 300,000 affordable homes by 2026. Throughout the pandemic, HPD continued to push forward our affordable housing production with a sharpened focus on the most vulnerable New Yorkers. Thanks to the leadership of Chair Cornegy, all of our partners in the New York City Council, the tireless efforts by our HPD team, partner agencies, and many others, we have financed nearly 195,000 affordable homes and apartments as of June 2021 in every borough and every single community district. Last fiscal year, we were incredibly proud to set new records for senior and homeless units financed, demonstrating that we achieved our objective of focusing our resources on meeting the needs of our most vulnerable New Yorkers. Creating a more affordable city requires a multi-pronged approach, including building new affordable housing in all our neighborhoods, 
preserving the ex existing stock of affordable housing and expanding the tools available to help residents stay in the homes and communities they love. The city has a robust pipeline of both preservation and new construction projects, but is always looking to be opportunistic about how we can create more affordability, maximize scarce resources, and ensure the overall housing supply increases in an equitable way. That is why early on in this administration, in partnership with the council, we implemented one of the most demanding mandatory inclusionary housing programs in the country, requiring that in every neighborhood, whenever housing is built through zoning changes, between 20 and 30% of that housing be permanently affordable. While most people only think about mandatory inclusionary housing or MIH in the context of neighborhood rezonings, it also applies in private rezonings across the city helping to ensure that the housing marketplace serves New Yorkers at a broad range of incomes. A key goal of the city's inclusionary housing programs is to promote the long-term economic diversity of neighborhoods. Through both voluntary inclusionary housing program and MIH, the city has produced more than 13,000 permanently affordable apartments across our city, many in neighborhoods that enjoy ready access to transit. In order to ensure this critical affordable housing remains a permanent resource for communities, the city needs strong enforcement tools. Intro 2411 would strengthen MIH and other affordable housing programs by introducing new enforcement mechanisms, a key recommendation made when MIH was approved in 2016. Currently, the city is limited in its ability to enforce the MIH program. This legislation would authorize HPD to enforce the affordable housing provisions placed within its responsibility in the zoning resolution through procedures such as bringing proceedings before an administrative tribunal within the jurisdiction of the Office of Administrative Trials and Hearings or Oath, establishing penalty schedules for violations of provisions of the inclusionary housing program, and issuing notices of violation for civil penalties. We believe this bill would provide critical enforcement powers to ensure housing developments comply with the ongoing eligibility requirements of the city's affordable housing programs. We regularly evaluate the tools and programs at our disposal to determine the most effective ways to address the changing needs of New Yorkers. Before the pandemic, we partnered with Chair Cornegy to establish a working group to revisit the third party transfer program, which was created by the city council in 1996 as a tax enforcement program designed to also address conditions in New York City properties that were creating risks to residents, communities, and the city as a whole. Administered by the New York City Department of Finance and HPD, the TPT program was a measure of last resort to convey ownership of properties with significant tax arrears and in many cases hazardous violations to qualified mission-driven and nonprofit affordable housing developers with the goal of creating and maintaining affordable housing by stabilizing the property's physical and financial conditions and keeping properties safe, habitable, and affordable for those who live there. In 2018 and 2019, elected officials, advocates, and community groups voiced concern. The various components of TPT needed updating and suggested certain key elements for potential re-examination, including the eligibility criteria and process for selecting properties for inclusion in TPT the outreach and communications to property owners, and other support in navigating the process of resolving outstanding issues, and the availability of financial and technical assistance to help address municipal arrears and, and physical conditions before reaching crisis conditions. In response to these calls for change, the TPT Working Group was convened to elicit ideas for operational improvements, ensure that the program achieves its secondary intended purpose of stabilizing properties in crisis, and contemplate changes in the criteria for inclusion in TPT. Co-chaired by Council Member Cornegy and HPD Commissioner Louise Carroll, the working group included elected officials, members of the HDC, HDFC coalition, legal services providers and tenant advocates, MWBE developers, property management firms, and community-based organizations with information provided by HPD, DOF, the New York City Department of Environmental Protection, and the New York City Law Department. The working group convened in four sessions between September 2019 and February 2021 that were run by an outside facilitation team. The sessions covered the history of the TPT program, the current state of the New York City housing stock and characteristics of properties in crisis, proposed interventions and resources to assist owners, 
or HDFC co-op shareholders of properties in crisis, specific recommendations for developing and or improving programs to support properties and recommendations on TPT legislation, in particular, the selection criteria for properties entering TPT. To, to facilitate the discussion of new criteria for inclusion in the TPT program, the working group explored the concept of properties in crisis and reviewed data across city agencies. HPD modeled potential criteria using a variety of data-based approaches, including indexing, weighted ratios, and the thresholds, and thresholds, and identified how each model impacted the characteristics of selected properties in terms of alignment with the overarching goals of TPT. The models with the lowest level of arrears, smallest number of violations, and most limited emergency repair program use were rejected. And the models with the highest of these were presented to the working group. The working group explored a range of proposals that both build on existing programs and resources, as well as introduce new ideas. Following the sessions, working group members were provided with a survey that cont contained a series of proposals for change. These proposals were made by or made in response to working group members' recommendations and comments during the sessions. More than 90% of working group participants representing a broad cross-section of stakeholder groups responded to the survey. There was unanimous consensus around several key programmatic proposals to improve the TPT process and to enhance outreach and financial assistance to owners. Those include the expansion citywide of the existing homeowner help desk in which community-based organizations provide intensive on-the-ground outreach and one-on-one -on -one housing, financial, and legal counseling to homeowners of one to four unit homes, and a new owner resource center for multifamily properties to provide and expand direct technical and financial support through CBOs to owners of multifamily properties citywide, including rentals and HDFC co-ops. The group also explored legislative changes to the TPT criteria and selection process. It was agreed that in order to meet not only the tax enforcement objective, but also the program's property stabilization goals, which can provide significant benefits to residents and communities with full rehabilitation and rent stabilization and other regulatory protections post foreclosure. The updated selection process should use objective criteria set forth in statute, including specific thresholds and be based on specific administrative data which applies to all properties citywide, is feasible to obtain and transparent, and can create universally applicable, reproducible criteria. The working group reviewed and weighed in on several options for selection methodology, the appropriate sources of data, and the criteria for selection and inclusion in TPT. While there were different opinions on many of the options presented, recommendations that garnered the most support by the working group members include eliminating the current statutory block pickup and replacing with selection methodology that balances considerations related to the physical and financial crisis conditions of a building with a focus on conditions of, li of life and safety. Also, including in the selection process all properties with debt in excess of one year tax class two or three years for tax class one of their tax liability with a threshold for inclusion based on a property's individual annual tax liability and not a citywide threshold. Also changing TPT selection and inclusion criteria to apply to one to three family properties, tax class one, multifamily tax rentals, tax class two, and co-ops if such properties exhibit crisis conditions and excluding one to three family properties in tax class one that have certain homeowner property tax benefits or exemptions. For example, the senior citizens homeowners exemption that require homeowner occupancy as filed with DOF. Also considering allowing HDFC co-ops to petition to have an opportunity to become an HDFC cooperative again upon meeting certain requirements after transfer and after the interim nonprofit ownership stage, exploring transferring properties, in particular class one properties, to community land trusts or CLTs, among other qualified organizations as the ultimate owner. 
While working group members had conflicting suggestions and concerns regarding each of these recommendations, such as concerns related to the potential loss of equity for lower income homeowners and homeowners of color, as contrasted to consistent treatment of all property ownership classes, many of those concerns would be eliminated or substantially mitigated if the city provided the robust technical assistance and support outlined in the programmatic proposals. HPD supports the working group's legislative recommendations, which were arrived at after extensive and rigorous analysis that was updated to better understand the potential impacts of COVID. TPT is an extremely important program, not only for tax enforcement, but also to protect residents who are the ones who suffer the most when a building falls into crisis conditions. As we have seen, it can have profound implications for owners and residents, and therefore has to be modified thoughtfully. As evidenced by our commitment to the working group process, we acknowledge that reform to the current third party transfer program is necessary, but we have significant concerns about the approach of the bill before us today. In particular, we are concerned that the new definitions and criteria could result in selection of buildings not appropriate for this program while also missing properties that might benefit most from inclusion. The methodology proposed was not reviewed or recommended by the working group and should be evaluated in depth to minimize unintended impacts. The bill also introduces a number of notice requirements that would be practically infeasible for the city to implement about requirements to get out of the program that are more rather than less confusing and potentially burdensome for owners. It also adds significant time to the process at every stage, which would be harmful, I'm sorry, most harmful for residents who in some instances have already been languishing far too long in buildings with severe financial and physical challenges. The working group's report builds on much of the work already underway to improve outreach and support for owners, especially homeowners. Recognizing early on the critical role that homeownership plays in stabilizing distressed neighborhoods and building generational wealth, this administration has been a champion of programs to increase resources for new and current homeowners. Through Housing New York 2.0, HPD launched the Open Door Program to create newly constructed affordable homeownership opportunities for first-time homebuyers and the Home Fix Preservation Program to provide low-cost loans and individualized assistance to low-income homeowners who lack access to traditional sources of lending. Last month, we announced the expansion of our Home First Down Payment Assistance Program to offer up to $100,000 per qualified first-time home buyers purchasing a home in New York City, more than doubling the amount of financial assistance available for first-time home buyers. We also expanded the Homeowner Help Desk in partnership with the Center for New York City Neighborhoods to raise awareness about deed theft and scams and offer one-on-one -on -one housing counseling, financial assistance, legal services, and other support to struggling homeowners. Expanding the homeownership help desk citywide is a key proposal of the TPT Working Group and would be complemented by a new owner resource center within HPD to support owners of multifamily properties, including HDFC co-ops. Given the diversity of the housing stock across neighborhoods, the city has long deployed strong community partners to aid in this important work. The Center for New York City Neighborhoods was created specifically in the wake of the mortgage crisis to address the foreclosure crisis affecting homeowners across the city. The center now provides wraparound services to homeowners and operates a homeowner hub hotline that evolved beyond its origins as a call center and a referral system to provide a more complex set of services. This portal allows homeowners to call the center and receive appropriate referrals or assistance, including through various HPD programs. While the administration supports the goals of intro 2436, which would create the Office of Homeowner Advocate within HPD, we would welcome the opportunity to, to discuss a more tailored approach that maximizes existing public and private resources to, to serve the vast array of needs facing homeowners today particularly low-income New Yorkers who are often more vulnerable. As mentioned earlier, the challenges we currently face are unprecedented. While we have certainly learned lessons from 9-11, the 2008 recession, and Hurricane Sandy, this sustained pandemic is unlike anything we've seen in our lifetimes and demands new and creative solutions in order to get us through and recover from this crisis. 
At HPD, we are also considering the lessons from past programs, especially those intended to convert underutilized spaces in targeted neighborhoods and help revitalize those communities. In particular, we are interested in exploring tools to produce more affordable housing in high opportunity areas to advance our fair housing goals. However, we want to ensure that any approach we take not only results in more affordable housing, but goes hand in hand with the holistic recovery agenda. And in light of the importance of commercial business district properties to the city's economy and tax base, consideration of any effort to stimulate conversions must take into account the potential for adverse economic and fiscal efforts, not just immediately, but for the long-term economic recovery and further growth. Most options for conversions that we have seen so far still require a substantial investment of city resources to finance acquisition, construction, and ongoing operations. As city capital is already committed to a lengthy and robust pipeline for affordable housing development, we need to think very carefully through cost and efficiency of conversions relative to other affordable housing programs and the trade-offs involved in the various alternatives as we navigate the uncertainty ahead and maintain optimum flexibility to ensure we can deploy nimbly and efficiently any federal funding that might come through a potential infrastructure package. It's difficult to predict how and when the hospitality and other commercial industries will recover or how that recovery will impact the central business districts in which these businesses reside. We believe it would be premature to propose an across the board solution. That said, we continue to work in lockstep with our partners through the many considerations that factor in into an economic recovery, including housing. Regard, regarding intro 2246, which would establish an office to affordable housing task force to study options and make recommendations for converting vacant commercial office space into affordable housing, we truly appreciate the council's interest in thinking proactively about ways to create even more affordable housing for New Yorkers. While the administration supports the goal of having as many tools as possible to create affordable housing, we would be interested in having further discussions about the structure and timeline for any potential task force, as any conversions would need to consider zoning changes and economic development impacts that rely on the expertise of our partner agencies. Intro 2312 would limit fees associated with vacating a premise. HPD has no specific concerns or comments on this legislation. With regards to intros 1613 and 2378, these bills were added with less than 24 hours notice, so we are still reviewing and unable to speak specifically to our position. In closing, I want to thank you for the opportunity to testify today. I look forward to our continued partnership as we seek ways to help New Yorkers pull through and get to the other side of this crisis as we work towards a more affordable and equitable city. We will now take your questions. Thank you very much for your testimony. Um, we will begin. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, sorry, we will now hear from uh, Ben Furness, director um, of the mayor's office. Uh, good morning, oh, I'm everyone. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Before, before your testimony, I do want to acknowledge the um, presence. I don't believe I mentioned that the council member Farrah Lewis is here and council member Dan, um, Barry Gudenchik is also has also joined. Um, we were also uh, joined by Council Member Barron. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Ben Furness, and I am the director of the Mayor's Office of Climate and Sustainability. I want to thank Chair Cornegie and the members of the committee for this opportunity to testify today on Introduction 277. The fossil fuel cars and trucks on the road account for about 30% of citywide greenhouse gas emissions and particulate matter from this traffic contributes to 320 premature deaths and 870 emergency department visits in New York City every year, with the highest concentration of pollution occurring in, in low-income neighborhoods. Uh, electric vehicles do not emit tailpipe pollution and are significantly more efficient than their internal combustion engine counterparts. Uh, and, and this means that electric vehicles present a tremendous opportunity for greenhouse, uh, greenhouse gas emission reductions and air quality improvements and are going to be a critical part in meeting the city's ambitious climate goals. Um, from the major new investments in electric vehicle charging coming from New York State and from Washington, D.C., uh, to new commitments by the major automobile companies, it's clear that the future of vehicles is electric vehicles and New York City should stand ready for this shift. 
Uh, even as we transform our streets and upgrade our transit system, so we need to drive less, we want to make sure that when New Yorkers do drive, we drive electric. I'm thrilled that this committee is hearing introduction 277, which would require 40% of parking spaces in new parking garages and open parking lots uh, to support electric vehicle charging stations by 2030 and require existing lots to expand their charging capabilities. Uh, we support this bill and its intent to increase access to electric vehicle charging stations, and we have some suggestions for amending the current legislation so it goes even further. Uh, building in electric vehicle chargers is cheapest and easiest when the underlying electrical supply is provided at the time of design and construction, so we'd like to propose that every new parking space be able to support a charging station without any additional work, and that 20% of those spaces actually include a, a charger. For existing parking facilities, in addition to the electrical capacity upgrade mandate in the legislation, we would also like to include a requirement that 20% of parking spaces have an electrical, uh, an electric charger by a date certain. Uh, increasing charging readiness now will have long lasting value. Uh, electric vehicles work best for drivers when charging is convenient. Even as batteries and charging technology continue to become more efficient, electric vehicles will always require chargers, and the electric capacity being installed today will be valuable for drivers who will be able to access more sustainable options, as well as being a potential revenue opportunity for parking lots and garage owners who have the option of charging uh, the use of their property for charging. Uh, this legislation ensures that New York City can accommodate today and tomorrow to, tomorrow's climate-friendly vehicles at a minimal cost. Uh, thank you all so much. I'm happy to answer any questions and look forward to working with you to accelerate our shift to a cleaner and greener transportation system. Thanks. Thank you. I will now turn it over to questions from Chair Kornke. As a reminder, if other council members would like to ask a question of the administration, please use the Zoom hand function and I will, I will call on you in order. Chair Carnegie, you may begin. Uh, thank you so much uh, for your testimony. Um, I, I am really excited today about some of the legislation that we're hearing. Um, the reform of the third party transfer program, which uh, again, uh, had a dis disproportionate uh, impact, negative impact on, on my community and communities like mine. Um, it was a long painstaking process of working groups, which uh, I really wanna say that I appreciate the advocates input and HPD's willingness uh, to do this work. And by this work, I mean this work. It was, it was very difficult for us to get to this place. And it took a, con a consorted amount, a concerted amount of time uh, based on the pandemic and the restraints around the pandemic. But I wanna thank HPD for, for, for its willingness and commitment to pushing through, even in the face of a pandemic, we could have easily pushed back uh, this work because we were facing that. Uh, but this crisis was as important um, to our communities as some of the other crises uh, that were happening simultaneously. So I'm, I'm, I'm forever appreciative of getting to this point at this time. Um, so please tell the commissioner I said that. Um, I'm gonna start with uh, questions around third party transfer, obviously. Um, the third party transfer program was enacted in 96 by the city council to collect municipal taxes and other charges while providing a mechanism to address housing maintenance conditions. The city is in a different place compared to where it was in 96. Is TPP, is TPP, is TPT still necessary in your opinion? And if so, why? Thank you so much, Chair Cornegy, for those kind words. And we absolutely will pass on that message to our commissioner. I do see that Associate Commissioner Kim Darga was unmuted now, so I'll let her respond. Great. Thank you, Council Member, and, and thank you for the kind words. Um, um, it was, I do think, a, a very robust process uh, over the last couple of years to evaluate the program. Um, and, and hopefully we'll get a chance to talk a little bit about uh, the working group uh, final recommendations today. Um, so uh, in terms of the role of TPT, um, the third party transfer program is uh, a tax enforcement program. Um, but it's also a unique path to stabilize buildings with crisis conditions. Um, in some case, this type of tool is necessary to remedy extreme problems. So we do believe that it fits in to a larger set of tools and resources um, in order to stabilize conditions across uh, various types of properties in New York City. Um, of course, this is not the only program that HPD administers to stabilize buildings. 
Um, we certainly believe that um, there are other resources and tools that are necessary as well. Um, and in the last few years, we have um, certainly tried to expand those other resources as well, including um, not only our traditional types of assistance to help owners address repairs um, and housing conditions, but also to help owners address um, uh, the cost of operating buildings. So for instance, we a few years ago worked with the Department of Environmental Protection to create a multifamily water assistance program, which provided um, a reduced rate for owners of affordable housing, regulated affordable housing. We launched our green housing preservation program uh, early in this administration to help owners undertake energy efficiency improvements, reduce operating costs. And I think most important to this conversation is that uh, in the last few years, we have worked closely with um, partners to also create new forms of technical assistance to help all sorts of owners um, stabilize, assess conditions in the building, stabilize their buildings, um, and determine what type of resources they need. So for instance, um, certainly we've been working with the Center for New York City Neighborhoods for um, over a decade now since they were first um, created. Uh, during the Great Recession, but we've supplemented the support that they provide um, through the pilot and recently expanded homeowner help desk. And also we piloted the landlord ambassador program um, more recently uh, in order to help multifamily owners understand um, conditions within their property and how to address conditions to stabilize them. Um, so again, we, we do believe that uh, third party transfer is a critical program um, when other forms of stabilization and assistance um, basically can't address the conditions and um, can provide a really critical tool to providing buildings with a, a fresh start and stabilizing conditions for residents. Thank you. Well, thank you for that res response. Um, I'm gonna, I wanna stay there a little bit. You know, the, the touch point, one of the touch points uh, around the third party transfer was the use of the term uh, distressed properties. Uh, so does HPD periodically review the distressed properties to confirm that they're still distressed? Because there's, you know, over time things, and we talked about this much in the, in the working group, uh, things, things change, conditions change. Uh, and and if, if you do check over a period of time, is there a prescribed time? What is the um, mechanism for checking whether properties are still distressed? Is it self-reporting? Is it, is it, 311, what, what's, what's the methodology um, uh, for periodically reviewing distressed properties uh, to see whether they remain distressed? Um, thank you for that question. So um, distressed, I think, can mean different things to different people. And I think it um, how we define it in part depends on the context. Um, so with regard to third party transfer, we certainly have, there's legislation um, that exists today that um, uh, limits um, the factors that we can use uh, to select uh, buildings for participation. Um, so we certainly need to follow the outlines of the current legislation. Um, but we have, of course, um, historically looked at um, indicators um, of financial stress um, by looking at municipal debt. Um, for financial conditions, we've looked at, or sorry, physical conditions, we've looked at uh, uh, housing code violations as an indicator that there are issues within the property. Um, in the working group context for the third party transfer program, um, we did have one of the first conversations we had with the working group was to ask the members how they define crisis conditions within existing buildings. Um, so we did start with trying to understand what a building in crisis, what types of um, conditions it has, what characterizes that building. And then for there, from that point, talked about how we can use administrative data to help identify those characteristics within buildings. Um, so hopefully that helps address the question. I'm certainly have to, happy to follow up if um, there's more specifics that could be useful. Yeah, I, I, don't, I, I don't think I heard from you um, how, how often um, uh, the process takes place. 
So I think it depends on the context. Are we talking about third party transfer? Yes. Yeah. The, okay. The, so in the, 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 the definition of distressed properties under the third party, party transfer, is there a way, a mechanism uh, by which we check the process of distressed properties? And like you said, distressed properties can mean, um, you know, financial, it can mean uh, the condition of the physical property. Um, what, what, what's, what's the tool? that we're using on board in particular to, to, to determine that and how often do we determine? Great. So um, the, the, the statutory definition has not significantly changed in the last couple of decades, um, or at least the third party transfer statute specifically. Um, that being said, um, the current restrictions in terms of eligibility for third party transfer um, are fairly inclusive um, and basically properties need to have at least one or three years of debt. Um, we, um, we certainly at the city have been thinking about how to characterize distress for some time, um, but the, I do believe the working group was really uh, the first effort in some time to work with stakeholders to really look at that definition and think about um, what is relevant today uh, for buildings and um, also to try to understand, as I mentioned, not just what, what are crisis conditions, how do we use administrative data to find them or identify them, but if we use different criteria for identifying buildings in crisis, what does that mean in types of, in terms of the types of properties that are selected? And are those properties the ones that are actually appropriate for this program? So for instance, as part of the working group, um, we looked at data that went into um, various methodologies, um, indexes, ratios, thresholds, and then looked at the impact of using those different methodologies in terms of the building characteristics selected. How many, how much municipal debt do they have? Um, how many violations do we have in those buildings? What are the building sizes um, if we use that methodology? Where are those properties geographically within the city? What type of housing um, are involved if we select, use that methodology? And, um, and that, uh, so that was all discussed as part of the working group. There was data presented, and then the members had an opportunity to weigh in on what type of methodology would be most relevant for a program, specifically um, the third party transfer program. And so the working group, um, after you know, the, the last couple of years of conversation um, and a final survey this summer, um, did say that they believed that the best approach was to look at a balance of considerations to, to first establish a minimum threshold for participation, and that that um, threshold should be based on a building's own tax liability. So not a one size fits all approach, right? Not just a thousand dollars, no matter what type of property are, right? But actually looking at that building's tax liability as the basis for determining a relevant threshold and that the debt, um, that annual tax liability need to exist for a certain amount of time. So one year in the class uh, for class two properties, three or more years uh, for uh, class one properties and for co-ops. And then on top of that minimum threshold, to look at, um, uh, and we looked at 500 properties as an administratively feasible group um, for the city in a program like this, because this is very labor intensive, right? Um, and from that point to look at, as I mentioned, a balance of considerations. Uh, the working group recommended looking at financial, high financial um, stress as exhibited through municipal debt, and recommended balancing that with looking at physical characteristics as exhibited by specifically uh, hazardous and immediately hazardous housing code violations. So hopefully that specificity uh, will, will help. I, I'm not sure if there's um, more I can talk about in terms of the definition of stress, but again, I'm happy to talk about um, any aspect of the working group recommendations or the process that we've gone through. Well, thank you for your uh, your your response. Um, 
uh, Deputy Commissioner Oakley in her um, opening um, uh, statement uh, um, alluded to the fact that um, while uh, we agree on the bill that's being presented today, some of the components of the bill, there are some uh, that are uh, give reservation uh, to the administration. Um, so in the last round, there were concerns with the way properties were selected for TPT. What do you think is the best way to capture buildings that have poor housing violent conditions or unpaid taxes? For us, you know, um, the bill removes block sweeps, which could lead to the transfer of a property that was not otherwise distressed, but has an outstanding tax lien and not the same block as a statutorily distressed property. Does the, 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 the city support that action? Uh, thank you. Yes. So we are still certainly um, making sure we have thoroughly read the legislation and um, uh, can evaluate the impacts. Um, based on a preliminary, and, and I just want to say we do support the, um, the recommendations of the working group. Um, there were programmatic as well as legislative recommendations. Um, one of the recommendations, as you've mentioned, is elimination of the block pickup, which is part of how selection is done today um, uh, based on the statute. And um, there was actually unanimous support for eliminating the block pickup and substituting a new selection methodology, um, as I just um, tried to outline, that would establish a minimum threshold for uh, eligibility based on uh, a building's own tax liability, and that would use a um, balance of considerations for selection, including financial and physical conditions to select properties. Um, there were certainly other recommendations of the working group as well. Um, some that had unanimous support and some where there was a little bit mixed, uh, more mixed feedback, but still majority support. Um, so other recommendations that are probably worth um, talking about also, streamlining payment options, enhancing resources for owners through the homeowner help desk and owner resource center, um, enhancing outreach, including through community-based organizations, uh, strategically at different moments in time. Um, and then there were some um, areas that I mentioned were, uh, that had majority support, but not unanimous support. Um, and that are some of the things I had mentioned about uh, selection methodology and thresholds. Um, as well as um, which properties should be included. Uh, there was some debate as well about that issue um, with the majority of members recommending that all prop residential properties be included from an eligibility perspective with the exception of certain um, class one properties uh, where the homeowner qualifies through uh, DOF for certain homeowner exemptions, including the senior citizen home owner exemption. Thank you. Um, uh, the bill also uh, sought to and seeks to, in its language, revise the definition of distress. Do you support that? Um, so we support all, as I mentioned, we support all the recommendations of the working group. Um, we do believe that the working group uh, final report and recommendations provide a, a solid roadmap for how we can move forward um, to update the program to make sure that it is relevant for properties today and um, provides, of course, additional support for owners as appropriate. So that, that report was released uh, yesterday, Commissioner? Yes, it was. We're very, we're very proud to have worked with you to do that. Thank you. That was that was a shout out to both of us, just for the record. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank thank you. I shout it I sh shout it out for you as well. Thank you. Um, it really was, I do think, a collaborative effort, and we appreciate uh, your work on that. As you mentioned before, uh, the bill creates more flexible payment plans for property owners who are unable to pay a sufficient amount towards a payment plan. Do you think this would help reduce the amount of properties that are eligible for TPT? So um, the working group recommended, there, there were some programmatic, some of this is legislation, some programmatic, but did recommend actually trying to, well, overall, that there be good customer service. 
And one of the recommendations around that was trying to streamline payment options. Um, currently, the there are uh, specific payment options that are dictated by the code for properties that are participating in the third party transfer program, and they are different than options available for every other property owner. And so one of the recommendations of the working group was to try to streamline that um, to create uh, less change throughout the process um, and to make sure uh, owners have the same types of options that other property owners have available for them. Uh, thank you. And my last question in this uh, regard, uh, well, last two questions, I, I know I have my, my colleagues waiting to ask, it's just this is, this is a very important bill uh, for everyone in the council. Uh, if this bill became law, how many properties would be eligible for TPT? Can you provide us a breakdown on what the universe would look like? And, and I'm asking that because um, obviously it is, it is uh, our office's intention and the working group's intention to reduce the amount of people uh, of, of entities involved in this, especially uh, in marginalized communities, we believe that the re revision uh, that are recommendations and revisions that are presented in the bill would significantly do that. Uh, is that also your opinion, um, or, or do you have some some data that would suggest that we're we're right or wrong on that? Um, so, as I mentioned, we're so I think there's a couple parts there. Let me just make sure I got it all. But first, um, we are still evaluating the full impacts of the bill. Uh, I think there's a lot in there, right? And we do want to make sure that we get this right. It, it is a, I think, a critical program, but it also has substantial, and it really has substantial impacts for the owners as well as residents. And so I think we, um, we are with you that we want to make sure that we get this right. Um, so as I mentioned, we're still evaluating the impacts. There's a fair amount to weigh through in there, everything from um, changes in criteria, um, changes in payment options, um, notice requirements, um, the amount of time things take. Um, and we do have some concerns with what we have seen prelim preliminarily, but we do wanna work with you to make sure that we um, address any specific concerns and that um, we, um, as much as possible, um, can follow the working group recommendations, which we do believe is a good roadmap for moving forward. On selection specifically, as I, we're, it, it is, there, it's fairly technical in the text. And so we're, I do wanna make sure we, um, you know, we understand it thoroughly before we present any detailed analysis. But from what we preliminarily understand, the, um, the financial threshold um, would be relatively low. And um, as a result, um, the properties picked up would likely have relatively low municipal debt. Um, and from what we can tell, would likely consist of um, a high percentage of smaller buildings and um, and potentially be concentrated in more so than some of the other methodologies considered by the working group in racial inclusion and equity areas, which was, um, as I think council knows, um, the RIE areas were defined as part of um, some work during COVID to look at uh, social, economic and health indicators. Um, and so those are those are some preliminary indicators that we see that are a little concerning. Um, and I think we would want to follow up to talk through how we um, make sure uh, that the selection me methodology employed um, achieves the intended goals of the program and that we are minimizing any unintended con uh, impacts. And I think there was a part two. What was the part two? I think I may have missed it. No, no, no. I think I think you've uh, addressed okay. what, what I said. Um, uh, and, and again, I'm going to ask this question, and it seems uh, counterintuitive to ask, but does the city support the new version of TPT as it relates um, to what we just spoke about? Um, so, like I said, we... In bill the, the bill, bill, bill in specific, in specifically bill on the, on, 
on the bill. Okay. So we, there are components again, in the preliminary re read that we support, I think, as you had mentioned, um, the block pickup, it looks like has been eliminated and there's a substitution of new criteria. Um, that we certainly uh, support the recommendations of the working group and there was unanimous support for eliminating the block pickup. There are, however, I think other components of the bill that we do have some concerns about and those particularly are the new selection methodology um, that substitutes for the block pickup as well as some of the notice requirements um, and um, some aspects related to payment that may be unnecessarily complex, as well as the timelines involved. So we would want to sit down and talk with you and council to discuss those issues more thoroughly and make sure that we as closely as possible align with the working group recommendations. Thank you. Uh, and, and, and really lastly, um, the, the threshold uh, is something that we looked at and that we sought to increase the threshold we yeah. found and you found, and I think the working group certainly found uh, that that low fresh threshold allowed for entry um, uh, uh, like Marlene's unders and, 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 and folks like that. Uh, so I believe the threshold was a, was $1,000 in the past uh, for entry into the TPT program. We look to increase that significantly. Do you agree with that? So we absolutely do want to make sure that the minimum threshold is um, meaningful. And in the past, the one or three years of debt, which was in the statute um, and the block pickup really did result in some properties being um, brought into the program that had pretty minimal arrears. That's something we don't, we don't, we don't want that going forward. I think we all agree on that. Um, I think the working group recommendation, so we do want to look at that threshold, absolutely. The working group recommendation was rather than a one size fits all approach, that we actually um, look at a property's own tax liability to make sure it's actually relevant for that property. Um, clearly, you know, for some properties who have, you know, debt, uh, you know, tax liability of, you know, 10 million a year, um, that's very different than a property that may have debt, um, or sorry, um, uh, tax liability of six thousand dollars a year right, in terms of how far behind they are in their tax liability. And so I think taking that more, more nuanced approach um, will help us actually make sure that the properties included in this program, just as a minimum threshold, that the properties included in this program are actually potentially um, have enough debt that it is, um, it is worth considering them. I would also say that in addition to a minimum threshold, one of the things discussed in the working group was um, and the analysis done was for uh, 500 properties, um, which is, as I mentioned earlier, what we see as potentially the right size from an administrative feasibility perspective, and that this really should be buildings that are the worst of the worst and some of these characteristics. And um, so the working group, uh, the concept outlined by the working group was to have this minimum threshold, but then really to take the top 500 worse the worst. So let's say there's 10,000 properties that still end up having that, that minimum level of liability that we would want to further screen um, and come up with the most relevant properties um, within that greater universe. So rather than the block, right, the idea is to then apply this other screening criteria to limit the number and to make sure it is really properties that are the most suitable for participation. Thank you. Um, at, at this point, um, if any of my colleagues have questions, we can begin that process. Committee Council, do we have a, a stack already? Uh, we do. Um, um, so I will now call on other council members to ask questions. Uh, council members, please keep your questions to three minutes, including responses. If there is a second round of questioning, council member questions will be limited to two minutes. A sergeant at arms will keep a timer and let you know when your time is up. First, we have council member Brooks Powers, followed by council member Barron, followed by council member Rosenthal. Council member Brooks Powers, you may begin. Time starts now.
Um, good morning. Thank you so much, Chair Carnegie, for the opportunity to um, provide remarks and ask questions in today's hearing, um, as well as my fellow colleagues and the staff to the Housing Committee um, as well. So I'm joining today's hearing on behalf as well as with my constituent, Ms. Diana Prashad, who will be testifying during the um, public remarks period. And the reason I am on to, in support of Ms. Prashad is because for over 15 months, my constituent has been experiencing a serious and longstanding dispute with tenants of a neighboring HPD property. Um, which has directly impacted her quality of life and threatened her sa the safety of her and her partner. Ms. Prashad and her neighbor both purchased their homes under HPD's Partnership New Homes Program, which requires that participants occupy the property um, for at least 25 years. But Ms. Prashad's neighbor is renting out her property to disruptive tenants who have um, threatened harm and created a, a serious quality of life matter. I have been working for several months with Ms. Prashad and other local elected officials, as well as local law enforcement, trying to find a resolution working with HPD. And today I wanted to take the opportunity to ask the administration about how it plans to resolve this issue at hand. Um, some of the questions that I have include, why has there been so much confusion about the terms of the Partnership New Homes Program contract? Why is DSS paying for a housing voucher for tenants in an HPD project that directly violates the homeowner's contract under the HPD program? Also, there seems to be miscommunication between agency that leads to a higher cost for taxpayers and poorer quality of life for constituents? How is HPD communicating with other agencies about the details and requirements of its program? For example, the tenants currently receive a voucher from DSS um, and it appears that there have been no communication to verify if this HPD property um, was even eligible to be rented out to a voucher recipient because of um, the funding streams and resources being provided. And I'd like to know how HPD plans to address, um, in this instance, the case, the situation with Ms. Prashad and this quality of life issue. Um, I'm especially sensitive to this matter, considering it's just a few blocks away from where we had another neighborly dispute that resulted in the loss of life for a 10-year-old Justin Wallace. And I feel that the matter has not been treated with the, the seriousness that it requires. And I'm looking forward to hearing the response from the question. Thank you. Thank you, council member. Thank you. Thank you, council member Powers for your question. Um, I am not familiar with the specifics of this case. And so we're going to have to discuss with our colleagues and we'll ensure that we have the appropriate folks follow up with you. I, I apologize we don't have more information about it um, to share today. And I could appreciate not knowing the specifics pertaining to Ms. Prashad, but in terms of the policy practice of HPD, um, considering HPD manages a number of programs um, and housing developments across the city, how is HPD ensuring that we don't have circumstance where we have another city agency that is providing city taxpayer resources um, for a voucher um, for a voucher program for a project that prohibits subleasing of that property. Thank you. Thank you for the follow up. Um, so where I understand that this does relate to homeowner occupancy of, of developments, um, what I can say is that we do take these issues very seriously. And in development, we manage a number of homeownership programs, including the Open Door program that we launched as part of Housing New York 2.0 that I mentioned in my remarks. Um, and um, uh, Kim's team manages programs for homeowner preservation. And 
for our newer homeownership programs, we have created standards to require annual primary residency certifications to address these concerns. So I, get, I just wanna reiterate, we do take this very seriously and that's what we're doing to ensure that those requirements are met and that we do have consistent standards going forward. On the- I'm sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. I was gonna ask when it's found that there's a violation, how can HPD quickly rectify that um, and also just want to point out this housing program is about 14 years in so it's not a new program um, and HPD has not been responsive to my constituent who's provided documentation um, elected officials from the congress member all the way to myself have written to HPD has had conference calls with the commissioner and we have not received any results, any answers from the administration? Again, I apologize, but I am, I'm not familiar with the particulars of this case, so I can't comment on the specifics on follow-up um, or anything related to that. Um, I think you do raise important concerns regarding um, primary residency requirements, and that is something we have looked at, and, and those are policies that we have reviewed carefully and, and, and standardized, um, but I, I don't think we can speak on the specific follow-up or case. And just one last follow-up, because um, <clears throat> one question I asked also that I would imagine that you would be able to answer, um, which is why is DSS paying for a housing voucher for someone in an HPD project that violates the homeowner contract that HPD provided? Thank you again, council member, for that question. Um, I think um, we can't speak specifically to, um, to that issue, um, but I'm, I'm sure we can follow up separately on your question. My, and I would just end with saying, my concern is that this is a safety matter is causing great emotional and mental health distress on um, these constituents. Um, and it's founded circumstances that have come out of the dispute between the homeowner and the tenant. And, um, you know, we have seen a reluctance from HPD um, for enforcing its own contract or working in a, um, a real way with DSS to one, find um, appropriate housing for the tenant so that they have housing that they are legally able to reside in with the voucher program. And HPD's reluctance to correct something that should never have happened because of lack of proper oversight for the programs that it runs and operates. Um, and, you know, it just runs the question of, one, HPD's ability to oversee its programs in a real way, uh, as well as protecting New Yorkers um, when we have matters that threaten the safety of our, of our residents in the community. Thank you again for your questions and comments. We can't speak to DSS matters, um, but we do appreciate your input and we do take the issues regarding primary residency very seriously. I look forward to having a formal response from HPD to answer the questions that I asked. Um, Chair Cornicky, can I ask that, um, that your committee ensure that we are able to get the responses needed from the administration? Absolutely. Thank you for your questions and we will follow up and get your office. Your office and my office can, can work on making sure that your constituent is taken care of. And I just want to know that, I want you to know that the uh, members of Queens and in your district have a pro in, in, in their new council member. Good job. Thank you. Now we're going to hear for questions from council member Barron, followed by council member Rosenthal. Council member Barron. Time starts now. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to the panel for uh, being here today. I particularly want to talk about the TPT program and try to get an understanding of the differences between what exists and what is being proposed. So there was a point where a distressed property 
was in fact taken over in the interim by uh, one of those groups. I can't remember which one it was very popular, although ran into problems later. Uh, and at the conclusion of that three or four, they had the tenants had to give up their lease, uh, give up all the rights that they had for a period of time until such time as all of those uh, shortcomings and failures and uh, sightings had been corrected. And then they were given their lease, but their, their uh, deed back. They were able to reclaim their deed. There was a property in my community, uh, HDFC, that was told uh, they were out of compliance. And they had these high bills for water, for real estate, and that they would have to give up their shares and that a new entity would come and take possession of that building and that they would then become tenants in the building where they had lived. Is that still the policy? Because we got a lot of conflicting information. Someone said, oh, well, no, they can't go back. They can't go back to the shareholders because they were negligent. And oftentimes it's uh, another person that perhaps is not getting the information to the shareholders as to what the current situation is. Shareholders may not even know. And I think that perhaps this new bill may require shareholders to be uh, listed as in fact shareholders and to get that direct notice. But my question is, does the provision now as proposed, uh, Mr. Chair, does that provision allow for an HDFC to perhaps get restructured to have new leadership, to get the financing that they need, perhaps by, shell, by selling uh, vacant units and generating those funds so that they can then maintain their shares in the building that they've worked so hard to uh, acquire. So Council Member Barron, um, we worked with HDFE, HDFCs and HDFC coalition uh, through the um, working groups and some of those things we were able to accomplish in this bill, some we still have to work harder to get to. So the answer is yes and no. Uh, the, the, your questions and the needs of HDFCs to do party transfer um, uh, were not uh, addressed in totality. However, some of them, some of them were. Uh, but you should know that the HDFC and the HDFC coalition was at the table and they did not miss a meeting. And I think we may have had five six hour <laughs> meetings, uh, I'm exaggerating, but we did have five uh, very lengthy meetings and went in depth. So the HDFCs were represented in the process. Um, I don't believe that we got everything you asked, uh, but we got um, uh, some considerable changes in the current legislation that we're proposing today. I think it's important that as we talk about uh, home ownership being the way to building wealth, that we not put people in a situation where their equity gets stolen from them because of someone else's negligence or oversight or inability to uh, manage what they were supposed to have managed. There may even be some, uh, some lengths beyond just incompetence, if you'll get my drift, that need to be looked at in terms of some of the management that uh, exists for the HDFCs. And I'm not in favor of people losing their equity that they've built over the years because of uh, some oversight. We are eager, I think, at times to give that pot of money or those benefits or reductions to a, a third entity, an outside party, some other uh, qualified entity, but not give that consideration to the shareholders. And I think that that's a gross miscarriage and it undermines what we say we want to do. And I know my time has expired, but I did have one other question, Mr. Chair. Yes, uh, it talks about the um, administrative fees uh, for the emergency repair programs that can go up to 49%. Uh, is there some provision for reducing that? That's like, you know, the uh, city parks department says it costs three, four, five million dollars to build a bathroom. And you and I could probably learn the trade and do it for much less and still be qual and still have an entity that's standing. But sometimes these fees are excessive. And is there any provision to put a cap on the administrative fees? Not in this legislation, Councilman. 
Okay, I have other questions and I'll save them for round two. Thank you very much. Thank you. Council member, may I um, yes. um, address uh, a couple of the questions, Council member Aaron? Thank you, yep. yes. Please, please. Okay. Great, thank you. Um, so I do want to talk about third party transfer with regard to HDFC co-ops. Um, I, I think those are some of the concerns that you've raised. And yes. um, the working group recommendations, I think, do provide a, a, a really a good roadmap for how we maybe can balance some of the um, issues here. Um, which are, I think we're all concerned around loss of equity for lower income and um, homeowners of color, um, especially with regard to building wealth, right? And so that was, there was a, a fair amount of debate and some difference of opinion within the working group. But um, the recommendations uh, at the end were as such, let me lay them out and then we can talk about maybe how they address your concerns. Um, the, there was a recommendation that all class one and two properties, class two properties, including co-ops be included in third party transfer. Um, and the, there were, there were some members that did not believe that HGFC should be included. Um, but some of the folks that believe that, um, believe that if there was really good, um, technical assistance available for HDFCs, including um, one of the recommendations of the working group, which is to create an owner resource center, um, which would provide really deep technical assistance assessments um, to the properties. Um, it's actually an expansion of the current landlord ambassador program, but would include HDFC co-ops and provide some of the assistance that they need uh, to support issues around governance, estate planning, some of the challenges that we see. Um, so have that on the front end. There are co-ops that probably will not be able to address their concerns. You know, we've seen some HGFC co-ops that have one or two shareholders left, really huge debt, really significant physical issues. Um, they're, they're really struggling. Um, it may be possible if some get to the point where um, foreclosure helps reset. Um, but the second recommendation is that rather that be a one chance and done, right, that we think of this truly as a fresh start. And what that means is that the co-ops then have an opportunity to re-petition to become a co-op again afterward. Um, there has been a prohibition on that in uh, over the last decade. And that's because I think there were concerns that um, eliminating the debt and then just setting folks back on the path without dealing with the larger issues um, would not result in different outcomes for that building, right? Right, right? But the idea behind the working group recommendation is you give people, you eliminate the debt through the foreclosure, mm -hmm. you help with renovations, you provide the access to training, and if they meet the requirements to convert to a cooperative, that they have that chance again. And so it's not that they're, the foreclosure basically eliminates any opportunity the folks have to access affordable home ownership, but it truly is then a, a path to stabilize the building it would also give the opportunities for some of the renters in a co-op um, to actually petition to become shareholders going forward. So it would create additional opportunities for folks that have been living in those buildings but haven't been able to buy in. Would that allow them to protect or preserve their equity? So that is the concept, right? So it, the it's not guaranteed. I just wanna be really clear, right? If the co-ops are included, They'll have the technical assistance in the front end. Let's say they get to foreclosure. They can't resolve the issues. They are going to become a renter rental on an interim basis. How, and that's an affordable rental, right? That means it's subject to an HPD regulatory agreement. They have leases that protect them. However, they then have the opportunity after the renovations are done to become a co-op again. They would have to meet the requirements meaning they have to make sure that there's sufficient interest within the building to become a co-op. 
They have to be able to pay their rent or maintenance to be able to cover expenses going forward. And they have to attend required training. Mm -hmm. um, but if they meet those requirements, then they get a second chance. So if this really is, it's a reset, right? right. It's a thank reset you. for people. Thank you so much. But just, I, I'm not getting the yeah. answer that I'm looking for. The equity that they had already built prior to the foreclosure and the training. Oh, and I see. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, this is better than that because the issue is, right? The So I'm just thinking about the last round of TPT. The, the co-ops that ended up getting to foreclosure owed over a million dollars on average, right? Okay. And so there was actually a diminishment of equity for the shareholders in those buildings. If we actually structured the program the way the working group um, uh, recommendations outline is that you get a, you eliminate that debt. Mm -hmm. There's a, a chance to renovate the building through an HPD program. Mm -hmm. And then they become shareholders again. And so the equity they have, it clearly would be based on the affordability restrictions. This is an affordable home ownership program right? But they would not have that debt there that then diminishes the equity they have in their home. So yes, they would have the equity without having the debt there that reduces what they could actually realize on a sale. Okay. So I'll take that to mean, yes, the equity that they have established, they would maintain. The, well, it would be a different equity because you wouldn't have the debt. Okay. Thank right? you. I'll, I'll, okay. I'll <laughs> thank you. And thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, for your tolerance. Of course. Thank you. Councilmember Rosenthal, do you have any questions? I do. Oh, great. Um, yes. Hang on one second. I'm multitasking. Um, yes. And sorry, I can't flip my screen. Uh, I wanted to ask about um, the TPT, um, partic in particular round X, uh, which was the city's last foreclosure um, TPT action. Um, sorry, hang on one second. Um, so at that point, um, I think it was in 2018, there were 681 HDFC shareholder households um, that lost home ownership. Correct me if I'm wrong about that. And I'm wondering um, whether going forward, whether or not there will be required on-site physical inspections. So um, apparently what happened um was in the last in that last round x there were um properties that were listed as having hazardous um conditions that actually did not um so i'm just uh wondering your thoughts about that and how you might um and your suggestions for how to write into the new legislation protections against that. Wait, wait uh, council member, do you mean, you mean hazardous conditions or distressed yes. properties? Sorry, hazardous conditions. Not distressed properties, hazardous conditions. On the distressed properties. Okay. And uh, I may not have this exactly right. So feel free to jump in if I'm not uh, the, the, only reason, the only reason I'm, I'm, I'm asking is because there are significant differences between hazardous properties and distressed properties. I know that we had focused and I would be interested to hear whether the commissioner can identify whether or not some third party transfer uh, 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 participants were drawn into the program through hazardous conditions or was it distressed property? I see. So commissioner, if you, if you could. Sure, sure. So historically, the eligibility for TPT was based on financial characteristics, specifically muni having municipal debt, right? So um, certainly those buildings may have had other characteristics, including housing code violations. Um, and oftentimes having municipal debt or characteristics of financial crisis is indicative of larger issues within buildings, including 
that the buildings may not be in good condition physically. Um, the working group recommendations, and I want to be clear, there's a little, there's differences here between the current draft legislation and the working group um, uh, uh, recommendations. Uh, the report was just uh, released yesterday, so it, it's fresh. Um, but the working group actually does recommend going forward that there be a minimum financial threshold to make sure, and that's based on a building's own tax liability, to make sure we don't include properties that don't have tax liability that's relevant for them. And then second, that we use a balance of considerations going forward which would combine um, looking at the worst of the worst in terms of outstanding municipal debt and looking at the worst of the worst in terms of housing code violations, specifically hazardous and immediately hazardous violations, which are the B and C violations. And there was some debate in the working group whether that should be all violations forever and ever, right? Potentially going back decades. And I think sure. this is, or more recent, and this is, you know, sometimes violations end up staying on because somebody doesn't go through the process of clearing them with the agency, even if they I think that it. that was the piece that right. people had cleared up things. There was no final right. uh, inspection. So the violations remained Our on the board. books and then, yeah. Right, so in this case, right, it really would be looking at those combination of factors. Um, and again, focusing on the top few hundred properties in terms of those characteristics um, and eliminating some of the um, legislative criteria that existed before that brought in properties that really had more limited issues, but because they were on the block. Um, now I do wanna say most of those, th those buildings uh, redeemed at a much higher rate too, right? Because they were able to pay and address issues. But the point is we really don't want to even have them in there to start with going forward. We really want to focus on the worst of the worst. Okay. And the last question is just, I know the HDFC um, working group mm -hmm. put out a paper that um, was, and I, I mentioned this because I have a range of HDFCs in my district, and I know Councilmember Levine does as well, where they're in you know all different types of shape. Um, so so it's you know kind of complicated. But um, I would just ask, actually, uh, yeah, for this legislation and for HPD to to be mindful of the working group's recommendations and to make sure they're taken into consideration. You know, when you describe the working group, there are so many different players uh, with different um, concerns that I, I can imagine it's very challenging to put together, you know, a piece of legislation or recommendations that meet everyone's needs. But I just, I'm getting the sense from the HDFC working group that their concerns were not given um, as much attention as they could. And so, um, yeah, I'm speaking on their behalf. Okay, yeah, so thank you. I mean, the working group absolutely did include a range of different organizations representing different interests. They were included. I think that their opportunity to participate was a bit restricted. So okay. um, yeah, I just appreciate I, I appreciate the time, Chair Carnegie, to ask the question and just am asking that you go back when you're reviewing all this, which I know is a lot, that you take the HDFC recommendations, which I can resend to you, um, that you make sure you have those in hand. Thank you, Councilman. Thank you. We'll, we'll certainly look at that. Thank you. I just one maybe quick note. Um, we did, in addition to the, the facilitated sessions by an outside facilitator, um, we did uh, provide individual members with opportunities to provide feedback outside of that session, including written feedback. And we did get some 
from some of the organizations that work with or represent HGFC co-ops. And we provided each individual member with an opportunity to complete a survey um, to make sure that the aggregate recommendations that we heard that individuals could weigh in on them and let us know if um, they supported those recommendations. Um, the, the working group report that we released yesterday does actually summarize those survey results, including where there were maybe some differences of opinion and how those differences of opinion could be addressed. Um, so we're certainly happy for, of course, any additional feedback. Um, but uh, there is also, I do believe, is um, the, the, the work of the working group provides a decent roadmap for how we can address the varying concerns that were raised. Thank you. Um, do any other council members have questions? Uh, if you do, please raise your hand. Okay, well, thank you. The Department of Buildings uh, submitted testimony in writing, but is unable to testify at today's hearing. Instead, Chair Cornegie will read questions related to, to Gib, uh, Councilmember Gibson's pre-considered introduction uh, into the record. Councilmember Cornegie? Uh, local law to amend the administrative code of the city of New York in relation to penalties for falling, I'm sorry, for failing to certify corrections of immediate hazardous conditions and the re-inspection re of immediate hazardous conditions at construction sites and the penalties for one to four family homes. How often are penalties issued for a failure to submit a certification of correction of an immediately hazardous violation? Oh, no. council member, just you're reading it into the record. So you can just read all of them. Oh, okay, I'm and sorry. And then uh, they'll answer them later. Thank you. How often are penalties issued for such conditions at a construction site? How often are these penalties issued for conditions not at a construction site? How often are these penalties issued for conditions at one to four family homes? How often does DOB conduct the reinspection of an immediately hazardous condition? How often are these reinspections of construction sites? How often are these inspections not of construction sites? How often are these reinspections conducted of conditions at one to four family homes? How frequently does DOB find this, the condition has been remediated, remediated? What is an example of an immediately hazardous condition that DOB re-inspects? Thank you. Thank you, Chair Cornegie. Um, I, um, I'm now going to call on the public to testify. Um, I'd like to remind everyone that unlike in our in-person hearings, uh, we will be calling individuals one by one to testify. You will be on mute until you are called to testify, at which point you will be unmuted. Please listen for your name to be called as I announce the panelists. Once the, your name is, is called, a member of our staff will unmute you and the Sergeant at Arms will set a timer and announce that you may begin. Be aware that there could be a delay in muting and unmuting, so please be patient. Your testimony will be limited to two minutes. Uh, First, hold, 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 wait, hold one second. I see that Council Member Barron has raised her hands. And before we move into the next section, I'd love to give her an, a, an opportunity. She said she wanted to come back for round two. She's right. back. Right. OK. Sorry. I hope the commissioner is still there. I didn't get clarity on my question, so I'm going to pose it another way. If I'm a shareholder, and I have accrued um, $10,000 in equity for the period of time that I've, I've had my, uh, my apartment and the building goes into foreclosure, do I get my $10,000 in some form or fashion? Oh, I see. it's like at a cash payment? No, Anything, no cash. Know? Okay. No well, cash that, payment, but so it is a potential retention of ownership. Meaning if you go through foreclosure, the, uh, the debt is wiped out, right? So let's say there's a co-op, HGFC co-op. It has affordability restrictions today, right? right? And so sales would be limimited. Let's right. say it owes a million dollars in debt, right? Uh -huh. When a shareholder, if shareholders could sell at any time, there's nothing that prohibits them from doing that. But okay. so let's say they didn't want to sell. Right. They could always sell and try to cash out. Now, they, right. the debt would certainly limit potentially how much they could sell for. Right. But right. Um, if they went through foreclosure, they're going to temporarily be a rental.
right. would have an option to become a co-op again. At that point in time, they would then have equity through the shares that they purchase in the co-op. And that equity would not be encumbered by the debt, meaning they would be able to sell, sell for the full value of those shares rather than a diminished value because of the debt. Okay, great. But they so, would not get a, as part of the foreclosure, their, they, they, lose ten, they lose their 10,000, basically. They they, don't as part of the foreclosure, they would lose that, but they would still be able to sell if they don't right. want to stay, right. right? So they can access that equity if they want to leave, or right. they could stay okay. through the foreclosure and access it again afterward. Well, have a new right. opportunity to start new, building new yes. equity. Okay. Fresh start. Fresh start. And I just want to say this is very different than other foreclosures, right? Where the only option mm -hmm. is foreclosure right. and you leave right. and you right. don't get that retention of homeownership long term. So this would be a very different structure um, where ability to maintain that ownership long term is actually an option. OK, thank you very much. And thank you, Mr. Chair, for recognizing me for the second round. Thank you. Thank you. Um, do any other council members have follow-up questions? I think it's also important, Kim, you might, you touched on this before, but related to the council member's question, I think it's also important to note the programmatic recommendations of the TPT working group in trying to prevent homeowners to getting to that point to begin with as well. Um, but I admire the council members' tenacity and, and making sure we answered the question. Um, uh, our, our ideal is not to get to that point at all so that those owners can maintain their equity. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, if there are no additional council member questions, we will move on to members of the public. As a reminder, you will be on a two minute timer. First, we will be hearing from Kevin Wolf, followed by Nolani Derrickson, followed by Russell Crane. Kevin Wolf, Wolf, sorry, you may begin. Time starts now. Uh, well, thank you very much. I'd like to thank Chair Cornegy and thank the members of the uh, Housing and Buildings uh, Committee for having us here. Uh, my name is Kevin Wolf, and I am the Senior Government Affairs Manager at the Center for New York City Neighborhoods. Uh, the Center for New York City Neighborhoods is one of the largest homeowner service organizations in New York City, uh, and we provide uh, services to uh, New Yorkers at all stages of homeownership, whether or not it is in the pre-purchase uh, process all the way up to the foreclosure process. And I would like to thank the New York City Council for providing leadership and providing resources to the work that, that we do at the center uh, from issues, whether it is uh, foreclosure prevention, whether it's tax liens, whether it's home repair, our black homeownership project, uh, our senior initiative, the New York City Council has provided millions of dollars in support uh, for the center and our uh, partners around the city. Just a little bit about uh, what we do and then we can get into the support, uh, our, our positions on some of the legislation that has been proposed today. Um, the uh, Center for New York City Neighborhoods, uh, we, as I said, we provide services at all stages of homeownership uh, since our founding in 2008. Our network has assisted over 100,000 homeowners, and we provided $33 million in di direct grants uh, to community-based nonprofits across the city, whether they're providing legal services, housing counseling, or financial counseling. Uh, and in addition, we were able to leverage uh, the public support uh, for another $30 million in indirect uh, funding support. Uh, one thing that I should note is that the center's work is counter-cyclical. And so when the economy goes bad, when we're in the midst of the pandemic or in the midst of the financial crisis, that's when homeowners need us the most. And so it's, it's so important to get the funding that we've gotten from the city in the past. Thomas, oh. I, I would just ask you, you, you know, you were, you were in, in, in your full stride. I would ask you to try to bring your, your comments to a close. And I know that you wanted to, to, um, to state something. So uh, uh, please, if you could, I don't, I don't want to be rude. 
Yes, thank you, Chair Corner. You much appreciated. Uh, we we do want to say that we support uh, Intro twenty four uh, sixty three. Uh, intro 2436, uh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Council Member Danique Miller's uh, legislation. Uh, this is this is really right up our wheelhouse and we'd like to, we, we support the leadership uh, that the Council Member has provided uh, and, you know, uh, believe that it's very important for the city to focus uh, on uh, foreclosure prevention and homeownership generally. And then as far as your legislation, Chair Cornegie, uh, we wanna thank you for the leadership uh, that you're providing uh, in this area, the third party transfer. We think it's very important to get to the root causes uh, and to really provide assistance for these homeowners uh, that are in these dire conditions. So thank you very much uh, for the additional uh, time uh, and happy to answer any questions uh, you know, uh, or follow-ups from the council. I just wanna thank you for um, uh, being a, a very strong advocate and voice uh, and working diligently to make sure that uh, residents, homeowners, uh, everybody gets an opportunity. So uh, I thank you for your work and I thank you for the work of your organization. Thank you. Um, next up, we have Nolani Derrickson, followed by Russell Crane, followed by Diana, Diana Prashad. Time starts now. Hi, good afternoon, council members and staff. My name is Nolani Derrickson. I'm on the policy team at Tesla. Tesla's mission is leading the world's sustainable energy future from the way we generate energy, store energy, to how we use it in our vehicles and home. We appreciate New York City's leadership on transportation electrification and are very excited to see Intro 277 proposed, which increases the electric vehicle ready percentage targets in parking facilities from 20% to 40%, no later than 2030 requiring a percentage of parking stalls to be capable of supporting electric vehicle charging is essential in reducing retrofit costs, which can be four to six times more expensive than in new buildings, and providing more electric vehicle charging access to city residents and visitors. This is particularly important for renters and for those who live in multi-unit dwellings. We are really supportive of increasing the EV ready building code requirements and have a few recommendations for consideration. One, increasing, increasing those targets from 40% to 75% by 2030 and potentially even higher for new residential parking lots since charging where your vehicle is parked overnight is typically the easiest and least expensive way to charge. We recommend adding a requirement for EV chargers to be installed We've seen ranges from 5% to 25% in other cities and detailing discrete step ups before 2030, such as percentage targets in 2025 and percentage targets in 2028. And finally, strengthening enforcement and tracking since implementation and awareness is key to reaching the intended outcomes of more electric vehicle charging. Again, Tesla supports the intent of intro 277 and looks forward to working with council and other stakeholders to expand this proposal. Thank you for the opportunity to provide comment here. Thank you for your comment. Thank you. Um, next, we're going to be hearing from Russell Crane, followed by Diana Prashad, followed by Arturo Miranda. I'm starts now. Good morning, Chair Cornegie, and thank you for allowing me the opportunity to testify before this committee. My name is Russell Crane. I'm a legal aid staff attorney in the Housing Justice Unit Group Advocacy Practice in the Bronx Neighborhood Office. At the Legal Aid Society, we represent both tenants and shareholder owners who live in tax delinquent distressed properties. I've submitted written testimony, uh, which is more extensive, but I do want to focus on a few points. While the news stories have covered problems in the TPT program, there has not been enough attention paid to the tenants of distressed buildings. For them, the TPT program offers an opportunity to remain in their homes with a new responsible owner who will invest in repairs in the building. We know that some believe that the process of the building entering the TPT is too quick, but for many of our clients who are tenants, the problem is that the process has been too slow. You will hear from Arturo Miranda about the suffering experienced by the tenants in 220105 Davidson Avenue. That's a 49-unit rent-stabilized building filled with hardworking tenants of color. There are currently 214 open violations of record. In the last 12 months alone, this building has received 59 hazardous B violations and 68 immediately hazardous C violations. We have been working with tenants there since 2016. 22 would have entered the TPT program in 2015, 
but for real estate investors who swooped in and filed for bankruptcy. The bankruptcy case delayed any action by the city for three years. Since then, now six years, real estate investors took control. The tax lien foreclosure remains incomplete because of the city's pause on use of the TPT program. There's no question that 2201 Davidson is exactly the kind of building that merits the TPT program. There's more than $15 million of liens owed on the property and over 200 violations of record. Therefore, our clients at Davidson have called on the city for there to be an active TPT program that their building can enter as soon as possible. We do have some concerns about the proposed legislation. We hope that the council will allow time to continue to work uh, hard. Uh, through the, uh, with the TPT working group and other stakeholders to incorporate those ideas into an amended program that will work for all of our clients, including those tenants who have been living for years in distressed property. Um, apologies for the notifications. Um, I see my time has expired. I, I, I would be happy to discuss a few of the points that we have concerns about if uh, the chair would like to hear them. Um, Russell, we can come back to that, but I do want to say to you, though, that we understood the gravity and the necessity for the TPT program during the process of uh, uh, this kind of whole uh, really taking a great look at it. The advocates wanted to dismantle, like, I can't tell you how many you know, threats I got for dismantling the entire third body transfer program. And it was, we had to work diligently with HPD to make sure that we kept the program, but made reforms because we do understand the value to, to residents. And that was the argument that I had, but a lot of people didn't want to hear that argument. They wanted to do away with the program because they felt that, you know, small homeowners were disproportionately negatively impacted in communities. But, but the premise of the program uh, is not wasted on myself and people who, who, who value the program. So um, I believe that we can walk and chew gum at the same time, which is protect these homeowners through the legislation that we're presented today, but stay true to the values of the program for residents, uh, for tenants simultaneously. And I, I intend to do that, but I thank you for uh, your testimony today. Thank you very much. Um, I've learned that Council Member Rosenthal would like to ask some questions to HPD. Um, HPD is not available to answer, but she can ask them for the record. Council Member Rosenthal. Thank you so much. I appreciate your letting me jump back on. Thank you, Council Member Cornegy. Yeah, these are, this is just for the record. Um, and it's the folks in, in my community, in the HDFC community, who are asking HPD to um, go back and look at the um, HDFCs that were foreclosed upon in the last round um, to have an opportunity to reclaim their ownership. Um, they'd like to be able to enroll in the tenant petition program um, that HPD and Councilmember Barron were talking about. Um, so I just wanted to get that in the record. Perhaps it can be added to the list of questions that goes over to HPD. And I really appreciate the opportunity to bring these up. Thank you so much. Thank you, council member. Thank you, council member, uh, will do. Um, next we'll be hearing from Diane Prashad, followed by Arturo Miranda, followed by Matthew Berman. Um, Diane, you may begin. We go on the seminar. Hello. 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 We can hear you, but you have a bit of an echo. Can you hear me? Yes, we can, but it appears you have two devices on, Diane. Yes, hold on. Yes, hi, again, my name is Diane. Hello. Oh my God. Hello, good morning. My name is Diane and, um, and, from, and I do support the office housing advocacy, but with restrictions from 3, 4, from 3, 14, 20, I have been having a lot of issues with involving HPD in their first time home owners program, which I'm currently purchased a home from in 27. All homeowners on my block are required to occupy these homes as their primary residence for 25 years. 
We received over $100,000 in grants, as well as tax abatements to remain in residency for a contract. Uh, homeowners begin moving out of these homes in 2012 and begin illegally converting these homes into rentals. By 2024, homeowners on my block were illegally converting these illegal conversions into, like I said, um, rentals. And by January 2020, I have been experiencing ongoing harassment, safety issues because of HVD, DSS, the mayor's office refusing to remove these illegal occupants that they brought here um, to stay in this illegally converted home that shouldn't have been rented out in the first place. Uh, HPD, DSS, and everybody has been aware of these problems since 20, uh, for going on 20 months, and nothing has been done to alleviate these problems of threats and safety to myself and my wife. Uh, they've been uh, the, the male in the house is a, a known drug dealer who's been using his property to uh, distribute his illegal substances. They've been having 48 to 72 hour parties spanning several weekdays uh, without any intervention from HPD or DSS. The, the, uh, both commissioners, as well as the uh, uh, council, Nick Lungan, who has been fully apprised of these ongoing problems that we have. Um, they they're refusing to speak to our elected officials. Uh, they made promises in uh, I'm expired. July 30th regarding uh, removing these illegal occupants from the home. And as of today, they're still here. We've been having numerous police presence on the block because of uh, the ongoing harassment with them. They are constantly banging on our walls, blasting music throughout my house. And it seems as though uh, the city is using them at this point to retaliate against us for speaking out against these illegal conversions and the problems that it has created for my home and the rest of the homeowners who are buying today contracts. Um, there's just been um, uh, ongoing, ongoing issues here, and we would like to know how would uh, this benefit us with having an advocacy uh, program if HVD is so responsible for utilizing this uh, agency for select communities. And uh, we just, I just don't feel that uh, having uh, OHC will OHC. change. Basically, I don't believe that OHA will change the mindset of this agency or its culture of oppression and suppression. We've been going through this as black homeowners, homeowners and LGBTQ family for 20 months. We're being harassed, and uh, my job is affected. I'm going through mental health issues because I, can't even, I don't feel safe in my home. I'm being harassed in my home, outside of my home, threatened with violence. And this is all because of HPD and their failure to monitor and enforce our contracts. We've been in contract with them. For 14 years, I've upheld my contract. HVD has not monitored or enforced its contract since January 2010. And in the interim, that is causing me quite a lot of issues, and yet I'm still expected to be in my residence maintaining my primary occupancy where I don't even feel safe. So I, I want to thank you for your testimony and commit to you that I will work with uh, Councilmember Brooks Powers, who's brought this to my attention. HPD Commissioner uh, it, it, it wasn't here wasn't here today, uh, and Department of Buildings is gone. However, your testimony is is being submitted for the record, and I'm I'm committed to when we get off this call to call uh, Councilmember Brooks Powers and to see what we can do together uh, to put um, some pressure on HPD uh, for your individual. Uh, a problem, but also for the, a larger problem which you've identified for us, which I truly appreciate. And I just have to add one more thing. Um, in terms of your uh, purview as a legislator and in terms of housing, I know that we are not the only uh, first-time homeowner program that is in existence, and it would behoove the legislative body of this city to take into consideration or at least go back to see what uh, are the regulations for these first-time homeowner ventures. Take a look at what communities are being, quote-unquote, revitalized and what role HPD is playing in impeding our quality of life and the progression of our property values. Because right now, I have a house that I'm paying $600,000 uh, is assessed by the city, the Department of Finance, as being uh, $600,000. But in actuality, because of what is going on here and what they're allowing, my home has been devalued, that it cannot even be sold. 
at a price that I, I would be clear of my mortgage. So it's a lot that's going on. It's, it's very, it's a lot of layers, and it negatively impacts uh, communities of color. And as a homeowner who has uh, basically done my part in this process, and HPD who is in contract with me, who have failed to do and protect me as a contractee, but is in turn protecting an illegal occupancy from an illegal conversion, which is costing me safety issues. That, for me, is nonsensical. I, I agree with you 100%. Um, I will, um, at, the end, at the conclusion of this hearing, uh, confer with your uh, council member and, and take some action immediately. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you very much. Next, we'll be hearing from Arturo Miranda, um, who will have an interpreter, followed by Matthew Berman, followed by Gloria Ann Kirstein. Hola, ¿cómo están? Buenas tardes a todos. Hello, how are you? Good afternoon to everybody. Eh, agradezco mucho por la oportunidad de testificar hoy. I'm very thankful to we have the opportunity to testify. Yo soy del edificio 220105. I'm from the building 2201. He vivido por más de 16 años ahí. I have been living there for more than 16 years. Voy a ser breve porque yo sé I'm que I'm going to be brief. Eh, hemos estado eh, en este edificio con una, de, una negligencia. We have been here in this building with a negligence. Una desinversión de parte de los dueños and, de él. And uh, this, um, not financial part from the part of the owners. Es por eso que nosotros queremos que nuestro edificio entre a... the reason that we want that our building o sea, transferido a, al programa TPT be transferred to the program of TPT. Muchos años estuvo controlado por un abogado David Fulton que nunca, nunca uh, pagó ningún many impuesto. years he had been controlled by a lawyer David Fulton que nunca, nunca pagó ningún impuesto a la ciudad that he, he never pay any taxes to the city. Por este edificio, además que el elevador por años estuvo sin servicio. And, and in, in one of the reasons that this building had been without service in the elevator for many years. En el 2015, en la ciudad de Pittsburgh, una ejecución. Una ejecución de gravamen por eh, fiscal. An execution. Por, uh, por millones de dólares. For millions of dollars. Lo que habría puesto al edificio en la oportunidad o en el camino para entrar al programa de TPT. What that means that they can, it will be the, the path to be able to get into the program of TPT. Más infelizmente ese mismo año surgieron unos nuevos propietarios. Uh, on that year, the proprietaries. Que tomaron el control del edificio de Sultan. That they took control of the building of Sultan. E inmediatamente tomaron una táctica o estrategia. And immediately they take a, a strategy and para uh, llevar para llevar a este edificio to a, take, a, 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 a bancarrota. To take this building to foreclosure. Entonces eh, yo prácticamente eh, ellos hicieron eso para atrasar el proceso de they do this ciudad. to delay the process to the city. Atrasando el pago, el, el pago de este, de este delay, inmueble. De, delay this, uh, the payment of this property. Gracias a los abogados de Legal Aid que nos ha ayudado. Thank you to the lawyers of Legal Aid. Y de la asociación de, 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 del Northwest Bronx. And the association of Northwest Bronx. Que se movieron para desestimar el caso de bancarrota. That they move faster to... Don't go to foreclosure. Basado a la inactividad, de, en este caso, de los propietarios, lograron que el caso fuera it, it, desestimado. And they make it that the case was desestimated. En el octubre del 2018. In October of 2018. Esos inversionistas. Those eh, investors. De nuestro edificio fueron a. From our building. Uh, transferir, eso nos ayudó a, pero más que nada a querer nosotros transferir that, otra vez el edificio al programa de TPT más infelizmente TPT, más infelizmente el programa estaba en uh, pausa unfortunately ¿no? the program was uh, can you repeat that? I'm sorry can you repeat that question again más el programa estaba en pausa para ese entonces the entonces, program was in pause 
Entonces, eh, eh, nosotros estuvimos durante tres años, desde 2015 we were, al 2018. We, from 2015 and uh, uh, 2018. Eh, sufriendo demasiadas violaciones. Suffering a lot of violations. Durante esos años, ese edificio During llegó years, a alcanzar 350 violaciones que están uh, prácticamente 350 en HPD eh, argumentadas. Todos nosotros nos hemos sentido All of us, we have been feeling que, que, que los propietarios nunca han puesto ninguna acción sobre, sobre nuestro edificio. That the properties have not taken any action on el, our el, building. El edificio ha estado lleno de plagas, de fugas, e inclusive... And the, 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 the building has been full of plagues and... Mm -hmm. e inclusive en la ciudad en el 2000, el 2015, the, the city in 2015 puso el programa de cumplimiento alternativo HPD alternativo alternativo Ajá. descubrió que realmente ese edificio uh, necesitaba un techo nuevo the real, uh, they need a, a new, uh, roof. lo cual nunca se reemplazó that they never was re replaced solo hicieron reparaciones eh, maquillaje only do uh, a makeup a makeup or a small reparation sí nunca nunca ahora durante el huracán never, Aya, never. eso parecía una cascada inundando pisos y pisos that was looking like a cascade sí. like a fall mr mr interpreter can you please ask him to um to bring the, 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 the we're over time and we have some more folks. Can you ask them to, 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 to sure. encapsulate it for us? Eh, señor este, Miranda, sí. si usted puede hacer un, un poquito eh, más eh, breve, abreviar un poco la pregunta, porque hay otros miembros que quieren preguntar en el consejo. Bueno, en realidad, en realidad ok, yo, yo entiendo, yo entiendo la... I understand in reality. Pero creo que era necesario también yo... But I, I think it was a, necessary a hablar, eh, muchos talk temas. about this los cual yo agradezco la verdad y me gustaría very eh, ahora en esta nueva oportunidad this new opportunity TPT abierto that que TPT se considere ya que, eh, ya que hemos recibido nosotros apoyo también we have been receiving de, del, del, del señor Fernando Cabrera del concejal from, uh, consul, uh, consul él, Fernando Cabrera él hizo una carta eh, se mandó a HPD He made a letter that apoyando, was sent to HPD, apoyando que se dé secuencia, supporting uh, the consequences, a la ejecución de de este proceso para entrar a este programa. To be, be, uh, so we were able to be, get into this program. También el, <laughs> el asambleísta Bichalo Cabrera, el senador Gustavo Rivera. Oh, also the assemblyman uh, Isualo Cabrera. Para nosotros es importante For que us it's very eh, important nosotros nos conviertamos en propietarios, cooperadores para nuestro mismo edificio, teniendo mejorías y viviendo de mejor calidad. Me ha sido justo la, la manera en que por muchos años este edificio years, ha estado completamente abandonado, teniendo una deuda con, con el gobierno de 15 millones de dólares aproximadamente. With a, a 50 million dollars, uh, Approximately, right? Eso es todo. So, please let him know that um, I spoke to both Gustavo Rivera and and um, and Cabrera. El chair McConaughey habló con Gustavo Cabrera y la otra el otro asambleísta. Mm -hmm. eh, de acuerdo. And, and, and let, let him know that we were we were reluctant to move forward with any round. Estamos reluctantes a movernos hacia adelante con con el proceso. Until okay. we had this hearing and we were able to make the reforms to the program. Este, así, mientras que podamos ser capaz de, de, de tener esta audiencia y poder con, empezar con las reformas. Sí, hay muchas cosas ahí. So, so I, you, there is a lot of things there. I will be reporting back to Gustavo Rivera and also Voy a to Fernando Cabrera a after Rivera. this to, see, to move forward on their behalf for a third eh, Para ver si lo podemos program. mover hacia adelante eh, con el soporte. Thank you. Ent Muchas gracias. Muchas ¿Entendió, gracias. Señor? Sí. ¿Entendió, señor? Sí, sí, entendí. Eh, I understand. Espero, I understand. espero sea breve. 
I, 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 hope it's, it's, I, I hope it's faster enough or brief, you know? Thank you. Muchas, Muchas gracias. gracias. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Muchas gracias por su testimonio. Gracias a todos. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we'll be hearing from Matthew Berman, followed by Gloria Ann Kirstein, followed by Kevin George Miller. Time starts now. Good afternoon. My name is Matthew Berman. Two minutes is a little too short, so I'll submit written testimony, and I'm opening to answer any questions you may have at the end of my testimony as well. Perhaps the council will be a little more accommodating of time if it sees fit to as well. Um, I am one of the lawyers representing the plaintiffs in a federal lawsuit challenging the legality of the TPT program. The case is Dorse versus the City of New York, D-O-R-C-E, and it's in the Southern District of New York Federal Court. I represent the hundreds of property owners that have their property taken through the TPT program. The case asserts that the TPT is unconstitutional and discriminatory, and unfortunately, the proposed legislation before this council does not fix those fundamental problems. The TPT steals equity from the black and brown community and gives it to developers. Council member Barron and council member Rosenthal are exactly on point here. Chairman Cornegy, your recitation of the history of the TPT is accurate but incomplete because the city itself created this problem by putting landlords in a position where they couldn't collect costs from the tenants and then the city walked away from the responsibility of maintaining those buildings. It wanted to hand them over to developers so that the developers would bear the costs and not the city and that's how we got into this mess. But the discussion of the selection procedures for identifying TPT properties is a mistake. We shouldn't be focused on that. The bottom line here, Chair Cornegie, is you cannot take private property without paying for it. The government cannot do that. It's unconstitutional. If the government has other aims, it has other tools that it can achieve them through. If it thinks properties are dangerous or hazardous, it can condemn them. If it wants to collect taxes, it can use the tax lien sales. If it wants to build roadways or other public uses by taking property, it can do that, but it has to pay for the property. Uh, we've got lawyers in here for the committee. I don't understand how no one has raised the issue that this is an unconstitutional taking, even if it wasn't targeted disproportionately. Um, so, look, we've got over $1 billion in property that the city has seized. If the TPT continues, it's going to continue seizing property, it's going to continue seizing equity, and it's going to create further litigation. And for the record, you know, I would request that this recording and all the papers and communications concerning the working group, which, by the way, we were not invited to participate in as their stakeholders, we request that that be preserved because if this law proceeds and is enacted, we're going to challenge it and we're going to seek an injunction. The proposed changes make things worse, not better, by larding up these properties with management fees, which make it even harder for the property owners if they find out that their property was taken, which was a problem with the original TPT, still makes it harder for them to get their properties back because now they've got to pay off all these third parties who are building these $5 million toilets, right? That's the problem. I want to thank the committee, and if you have any further questions, I'm happy to respond to them. No, thank you, and thank you for your testimony. Um, actually, these hearings are so that we can hear all state from all stakeholders. Uh, I'm, it's unfortunate, and I don't know what the circumstances were that didn't have you at the table during the working group. I apologize for that. But one of the things that I enjoy, wh whether people are in agreement with my decisions to put forward legislation or not, we at the very least get an opportunity to hear from and to make legislation better and or this is the process where we determine whether or not legislation even goes forward. So it's not a wasted um, uh, opportunity for you to voice your opinion on behalf of obviously uh, uh, some folks who need to be heard. So thank you for your testimony. Okay, thank you. Um, next we'll be hearing from Gloria Ann Kirstein, followed by Kevin George Miller, followed by Craig Hausen. Time starts now. Okay, I'm Gloria Ann Kirstein. I'm an HDFC shareholder since 1993 in a building where I've lived since 1982. I also worked for HPD Code Enforcement for 26 years uh, and have since retired. I am also a member of the HDFC Coalition, and we have focused on the TPT foreclosure process in the city simply because HDFCs are the biggest recipients of the damage that this program can render to those communities that have HDFCs uh, that are in distress. I would like to point out uh, to the committee 
that HDFC co-ops are the only housing stock in the entire nation where the majority of homeowners are persons of color, the only stock. And yet in the latest round of foreclosures at TPT transference in 2018, 45% of the properties foreclosed were HDFC co-ops, but HDFC co-ops in New York City only represent 1.2% of the entire apartment housing stock. So we're 45%, almost half of all foreclosures are against HDFCs, which are again, mostly owned by persons of color and were such a small percentage of the whole apartment stock. And these buildings went for $1, to developers with total tax forgiveness. So anything that is said that TPT is a tax collection program is untrue. TPT forgives the prior taxes, arrears to the TPT developers and going forward, they get uh, tax waived uh, again. Uh, we welcome the opportunity to continue, however, to collaborate with Council Member Cornegie uh, with the reforms that are necessary. We ourselves only had a week to look at this and wish we could have more time, but here are the things uh, that we feel would strengthen the bill that Mr. Cornegie um, and staff are, are promoting. Number one, the City Council should be required to vote directly to foreclose a property. Right now, the way it works is a list is given to- I've expired. Uh, I'm sorry. They said your time was expired, but please continue. I've already done two minutes. <laughs> okay. Oh. Time, time okay. flies. Time flies when we're All right. Fun. I'll just go. Uh, City Council should vote directly to foreclose number one. Number two, manageable repayment plans of arrears with uh, to forego the 18% interest rate compounded daily makes it impossible for HDFCs to pay their arrears. Number three, the tenant petition program that Council Member Barron was referring to and Council Member Rosenthal must be retroactive to the last round so that these 681 households that got foreclosed uh, from HDFCs have the opportunity to recombine and, and get their uh, finances and everything in order and reclaim their home ownership. And four, the quality of HPD's violations must be controlled. They must be scrubbed for any violations that are ancient dating from the 80s and 70s. They must be scrubbed for duplicates. They must be scrubbed for those violations that are shareholders responsibility and also for those uh, violations that are uh, accrued from apartments that are not paying their maintenance and are taken to court and want to strengthen their non-payment by having high violation count. Uh, so those are the four ways that we think it can be, uh, this bill can be strengthened. We have others that we will submit. I would also like to talk about the four that we really support. Do, you, do I have time for that? Uh, Gloria, how long do you think it'll be? Because, you know, I, I, it was, it's, a been, and a half? it's, been, it's been great to, to work with you and, and I want to continue working with you, but we have some more folks who, All right. Who need to be heard. I, so. I, I, I have three that I, we supported. We just wanted to not just say, you know, you were missing things in the bill. There are also three that we supported, um, including your extended notification, including your um, repayment plan of 5% down with a much more extended uh, repayment time frame of 240 quarters. We also like the idea of the homeowner ombudsman. And we also uh, like the idea of exempting HDFCs from TPT until that whole process can be ameliorated so that the city makes a, a firm decision to save this very unique home ownership. Thank you. Like I said, it, it was a pleasure, it was a pleasure to work with you. And that's a, that's a testament to the fact that we can work together. So we can disagree and we can find ways to strengthen the bill and we can and we can work. That that's what hearings, I keep reminding people that that's what these hearings are for. This is not a vote. We're not, this is not a vote. This is for us to discuss the bill in its entirety to some degree and to find ways and recommend recommendations uh, to make it work for everyone. So thank you. And thank you to the HDFC coalition who I've relied on uh, a lot to get us to this place. Understanding that there's more work that needs to be done. This is not final in any imagine, stretch of the imagination. The next chair of housing and buildings is gonna have to deal with some things that we don't address and don't get done now. I understand the need to, to while we have this door open to get as much as we possibly can done. But quite conceivably, I won't be able to complete every every need, but I will have addressed it and and, and my successor uh, will have at least a good platform and foundation and a great working group to go forward with to get to a place where everybody's taken care of, especially our H HDFC co-ops, which I am clearly aware uh, that a lot of my district has benefited from, um, whether it's HDFC co-ops co or whether it's Mitchell-Lama, um, home ownership has come in many different forms in the city of New York, especially for people of color. 
Uh, and I'm aware and my staff is aware of that. And so thank you for, for, for being able to work with you and your spirit around getting some good work done together. Thank you. Um, Council Member Barron, do you have any questions? Uh, yes. Thank you. Yes, I do. Uh, I'm so glad to have uh, kept my uh, system on and listened to the testimony of the panelists because it's been very enlightening and helped to clarify the question that I asked in so many ways and didn't get a direct answer in terms of losing equity. And uh, I'm so glad that Mr. Berman made it very clear. People have had their property taken with not appropriate compensation for taking their property. And it seemed that way to me, but I hope, I think the lawyer helped to put it in legal terms. How do you do that? How do you do that? Uh, even, if you, even if you condemn someone's home or if you take the property for, um, uh, the common good or the city good or whatever they call it, I can't think of the proper phrase, you, you give them compensation. So if these are people who have earned equity, who've gained equity, they should be compensated. And it was sort of convoluted when the answer was given, well, yeah, then they can start new. Yeah, but what about all the money that I invested in the years past? So I think that that's a significant, I think it's a direct answer to my question. I think it's a significant piece to be considered. Uh, so Councilmember Carnegie, your bill is quite lengthy and you know me, I'm the one to sit and turn each page and read each of it, uh, each of the things. And it's gonna take me a little while to get through that. And I have heard uh, from Ms. Kirstein who said that there are things that they would like to see added. So the question that I have is in its existing form as I continue to read through this bill, in its existing form, do you have any objections? Uh, do, or do you think there's uh, elements of the bill that are not beneficial uh, in its current form? Uh, uh, as the council member said, we- uh, uh, Again, again, council member Barron, that's what this is about, right? So I, I, right. Never, right. I never expected to present a work product today that everybody loved and agreed with because right. there's so many different vantage points. So the answer, is, the answer is yes. Am I open right. to making open to making sure that this bill includes right. HDFCs in a way that makes sense? Includes yes, but I must say that um, I don't want I don't want uh, good to be the enemy of of of, of great in this instance. Right. Meaning that there is so much more work we can do. This is the door open into right. this bill, right? I, and it I appreciate that. It, it wasn't an, an assault or an attack on you. No, 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 I know, I know, no, no. I didn't take it that way. I didn't take it that way okay. at all. Okay. No, 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 not at all. Uh, uh, so but all I just I'm wanted. I just wanted to ask, uh, particularly uh, lawyer Berman, attorney Berman, in its present state, uh, the legislation that's been presented, is there some glaring flaw that you see? Yes, the glaring flaw is that the government cannot take property without paying for it. If the gov to answer your question that you raised earlier, what happens if there is a hazardous condition or a property that presents a hazard to the community? The city has the power to deal with that, but if the if the property has value, it has to compensate the owner for the value. That's the rule. Thank you. So, Thank that's, you so, so here's the thing. Here's the thing. Yes. That's one component of the bill. On the other side, I have a whole group of family that needs to be small homeowners that need to be protected from this process. And that was the intent of the bill of the bill. It was very comprehensive in what we did because we had this long drawn out process. Right. Am I willing to tease out the HDFC portion of this to look closer at equity and all of that? Yes. But I don't want to stop this bill with okay. it, in its form to protect uh, uh, small homeowners against the third party transfer program and the taking of their properties. So we, we can walk and chew gum at the same time. We, we, we tried to make it very comprehensive, which I'm not thrilled about, right? The comprehensive bills, so much stuff can happen in that. Right. So am I willing to say, hey, let's go back and look at a really more targeted focus on HDFCs? Yes, but I'm not willing to not go forward with the bill at the risk of these homeowners who've lost so much already, small homeowners, right? So it's, we, can, we can walk and chew gum at the same time. But I also want to point out that um, it's my understanding um, that equity in co-ops is not built the same way that equity in other properties is built. And that should be noted. That is not an excuse for protecting people's equity, whether it's a dollar or a million dollars. But equity is built in a co-op structure different than it's built in, in, in a normal structure. So but that's, again, that is just a, a slight 
uh, understanding of the language, not an effort to say that we shouldn't uh, protect their equity. Great. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, next, we'll be hearing from Craig Housen, followed by Blanca Vasquez. Time starts now. Mr. Housen? It looks like he's actually no longer on. Um, uh, we'd like to hear from Blanca Vasquez. Time starts okay. now. Hello, am I going? Yes, yes, you may go. Okay, I'm Blanca Vasquez. I'm a member of the HDSC Coalition Anti-Foreclosure Committee. And I'm here to advocate for a simple reform that will protect HDFCs and the possibility of home ownership for another generation of working and middle-class New Yorkers. And it's just this, an early warning system on arrears. I would name it in honor of Will Buckery, a member of the HCFC coalition and an original shareholder. What HPD did for his Harlem HCFC decades ago and needs to do once again is to alert shareholders that their HCFC is endangered by instituting a simple step in the process, a trigger alert, send, simply send mail, a written alert in English and Spanish and any other relevant language to all shareholders on record that their co-op is falling into arrears. The criteria could be four quarters or three quarters in arrears and that the problem must be addressed now. For Will's building, they were alerted while what was owed was a manageable amount of money, like twenty dollars or $30,000, and they got it together. That is, get help before the onerous penalty rates kick in, before issues become more difficult to reverse. Simply alert all the shareholders. Our experience is that affordable HDFCs can be reorganized, people's equity can be protected, and home ownership can be retained. The Anti-Foreclosure Coalition Committee met with 18 HDFCs that we saved that were in arrears. We conducted, helped them to conduct uh, new board elections and that represented 503 households. On a volunteer basis, without charging anybody a penny, we saved 18 HDFCs. That means the city can do it too. An early warning system is a simple way to protect and preserve this housing stock. It protects your constituents, many of us of color, and honors the principles of equity in the intent of the original legislation, which highlighted identifying problems early in the original legislation. So HPD is not doing that, and it can do that. It's really easy to do. Thank you. So, um, Ms. Vasquez? Yes. 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 <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, this concludes the public testimony. If we have inadvertently forgotten to call on somebody to testify, that person could raise their hand using the Zoom raise hand function. We will try to hear you now. If, if, if there is no one else, I'd just like to say that um... This hearing reminds me of what a weirdo I am because I love this and I love this work. So I know that there are some people who wouldn't want to sit through and hear opposing big voices, but I am truly a weirdo. I, I, I love this in an effort to make things better. So those of you who stayed and who have uh, added to um, uh, this hearing, I greatly appreciate your commitment to the communities that you serve, whether you be a member or whether you be just a resident or a tenant um, your voices are heard. Uh, I'm reinvigorated today by what I've heard uh, to go back to the drawing board and to make sure that homeowners and shareholders and stakeholders are all included. Um, every piece of legislation is not perfect. That doesn't mean we don't continue to work to get to a place uh, where we can where we can protect uh, people. The housing stock in the city of New York remains in constant jeopardy for one reason or another. Home ownership remains in jeopardy. Tennessee remains in jeopardy. And this is why we do the hard work that we do. I thank you all for your advocacy. Um, the recommendations um, we have, and I will go back and look at, 
I intend to work till December 31st uh, uh, on, on this and, 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 and major other things uh, to leave a legacy and leave a roadmap for my successor and the new council that's coming in to pick up the mantle and continue to do the work. So I want to thank all of you. I really appreciate today's hearing. You have no idea. I know it makes me a weirdo, but I'm even more excited.